Hello, hello, hello. All you bright, shining idealists. This is Harry Knight. Harry's 11 years old. Harry's here from Calgary by kind permission of his father, Peter, who's also here with us. Harry's going to kick off this 19th edition of Idea City. Yes, 19 years so far. With a flamenco inflected version of O Canada. After that, he's going to play a tune of his own choosing. And after that, a big surprise. He'll be joined by his old pal and mentor, Pablo, the dynamic, the romantic, the dramatic Pablo. Um, and then I think we're going to have a little jam all together. So if you would all please rise for the national anthem. <laughs> Peter Diamandis.
stage my good buddy Pavlo and his band. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us here. We've been here a few times over the years and it's always a spectacular event. I'd like to invite back to the stage my very good friend, Harry Knight. Yeah. 
Harry I met when he was seven years old, a long time ago. And we'd like to have him join us on this next piece. If you have that undeniable urge to physically express yourself, please feel free to dance. Gene, let's go. Oh! <laughs> Starting to creak a little bit. Let's get a picture. Harry, why don't you sit there? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we get a picture. Oppa! <laughs> Oppa, Oppa, here we go. Copa, Cabana. Okay. Cabana. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So while they're striking the stage, I've been asked to kill a little time, and I thought, because I've heard that there are quite a few new people in the audience, that I tell you a little bit about what we do here. One of the things I do is I throw tchotchkes out into the audience. <laughs> and, um, and so it's a good idea to sit front, because, for example, hats are not very aerodynamic, and they just don't carry very far. Now. Last year, and I think the year before that, I managed to get one big one. I think I got it into the balcony, or I think I want to believe that I got it <laughs> into the balcony. But then the insurance guys came at me, and they said, your life, you know, your key man life policy does not include dislocating your shoulder <laughs> and writhing in agony on the stage. So 
I'm going to toss stuff out, but not that far, unless we get a designated thrower to work with me. Um, we have these things sized. Anybody want an Excel? <laughs> Anybody want to admit to an Excel? Okay. Right. So the other advice I have is, um, in the breaks, you want to walk around. There's lots to see in the lobby, but there's also lots to see on the second floor, particularly the bookstore, because many of the people who speak here have published wonderful things, and you're going to want to read them in detail and take them home. I'm just holding out the product of just the first cluster of speakers. Um, also on the second floor is Miniature Land, and then at the far end, you have to fight your way through the crowds on the first floor, the lobby floor. There's this wonderful installation by Self Traits where you can get little mini-me's done for like practically nothing. It used to take Michelangelo with the talent of a great sculpture to be able to reproduce you, and now single exposure, billion cameras and 3D printer, and there it is. Also, fabulous, less expensive and faster process for putting that image inside a crystal. You've got to check it out. They're really wonderful. And they cost bupkis. That's Yiddish for not very much. Um, the other thing you may have found on your chair are these things, paddles. They're the latest in technology, <laughs> which we'll be discussing extensively today. Uh, red for no. Green for yes. So as we go through the proceedings, we may call for these uh, instant uh, votes. For example, why don't we kind of rehearse now? Could all of you who are new put up a green side paddle and we can see? Whoa. OK, so I'm right to be offering all of this instruction. Uh, we do other wonderfully old-fashioned things, like we have program books, an actual physical old-fashioned book. We love these books. We work hard on them. We enjoy the collaboration of Context Creative, who work with us on them year by year. They win awards every year. They're spiral-bound, which means you can open them up. And we've thoughtfully provided space where you can keep your notes. Yes, pencil, paper, keep your notes. And you'll find, if you keep these things as I do, that they will help you remember wonderful days and interesting talks. So, have we cleared the stage? We're good? Yep. OK. So I'd like to have the vote tally put up. We posed a question before this session. And put this question out online and got quite a few responses. And this is the answer to the first question. Each of us is more empowered than ever to solve grand challenges. Good majority agree. A uh, persistent minority disagree. Second question, tech is not always good for humanity. An even larger proportion agree. Smaller proportion disagree. In a sense, these votes are predictable. In a sense, they're a little contradictory. And we're going to be dealing with all of that as the conference progresses. So let's begin the great debate. Um, since the day that Peter Diamandis and uh, Ray Kurzweil and Bob Richards first announced Singularity University on this stage in 2008, we have been believers in, exponents of, and proselytizers uh, for the Singularity brand of digital utopianism. Peter Diamandis, who is with us today, a Greek boy. I hope you appreciated the music, Peter. Yeah. Um, he, together with the uh, graduate level university which Singularity has become, plus all the many thousands of people in that orbit have all become and continue to be the world's great evangelist for the revolutionary ability of new exponential technologies to solve the world's great problems. Nonetheless, in the last year or two, the sheen has begun to come off the digital rose, and many of the darker undersides of the digital promise 
have come into view. So it's said that news is, by its nature, bad news, that good news is PR, publicity, science, medical breakthroughs. But on the social side, in the worlds of culture and politics, things lately have turned sour, actually quite nasty, and we seem confronted, not just by the usual challenges that attend the introduction of any new technology, but by fundamental changes and fissures so deep that they seem to threaten our very society as they destroy democracy. I'll just read off a list of these faults. Widespread fraud, bots, not people, fake news, extremist news, multiple divisions in society, racism, sexism, ageism, terrorism, unsavory images, horrific images, horrific products, all have led to a catastrophic loss of trust. And hanging over it all, looming over it all, is the prospect of mass unemployment and social dislocation on an epic scale as AI replaces humans. So, to address all of this, and in a departure from our usual format, we will stage the great debate. Lead-off speaker is Peter Diamandis. He will be countered by an antithesis, a statement by Diane Francis. That'll be followed each by rebuttal. He'll have a rebuttal, she'll have a rebuttal, and when all that is done, I will call out a panel of commentators, critics, and cross-examiners. Each, in turn, will have an opportunity to make their comments on what they've heard, plus pose questions to the original speakers. And when all that is done, I will gather them all in a group, and we'll have a uh, scrum and a free-for-all and possibly find some consensus. So as I said, the going in votes are, if we can put them up again, please. Each of us is more empowered than ever. Good majority, disagree, kind of an NDP minority. <laughs> Permanent. Tech is not always good for us. A larger majority and a smaller group of disagreeing. OK, Peter, you're up. Just, just before Peter starts, I, I want to tell you that um, he's one of these rare guys who uh, picked up a doctor's degree from Harvard Medical School, no less, just to please his parents. <laughs> but having done that, he then went on to uh, found the X Prize consortium of prizes. And as you know, there are these brilliant ideas whereby you generate a tremendous amount of activity by pulling up a relatively small prize and having competing groups across the world work towards a spectacular finish, and they have been spectacularly successful. He is also a veritable whirling dervish of company creation. He started companies that uh, look for and will mine uh, rare earth elements and minerals and asteroids. He's started a company that offers you a zero-g parabola joyride at the edge of space. He started a company that is in pursuit of radical longevity. He's recently, yesterday, started a company that's going to personalize cures for cancer and other diseases. He's an amazing guy. This is Peter. Before you Diamandis. go, Moses, <clears throat> because I don't want to use my 10 minutes on this. No, you're going to get No, no, no. Come, come here, pal. So uh, it's, it's very important to me. I, I'm here as a huge fan of Moses Neimer. Uh, and I just a, a small story I want to share with you. Uh, this was about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when in the days after Ray Kurzweil and I had our dinner in which we proposed this idea of creating this singular university, uh, I was having a conversation with Bob Richards, who's one of our associate founders, and said, we need some startup capital. And I remember exactly where I was, where Bob and I said, let's give Moses a call. <laughs> and 
uh, this is the kind of man who Moses is. Uh, we called him on this dream and said, would you provide us the seed capital to start this university? He was the very first person we called, and Moses was the very first person to uh, help fund, and now, you know, a decade later, Moses, this, this has come into existence because you said yes. Thank you. We are living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history, a time where each of you have the power to solve any problem you desire. I had a chance to write a book about this. It's called Abundance, the Future is Better Than You Think. I was the closing speaker at the Clinton Global Initiative, and as President Clinton uh, brings me on stage, he says, Peter, why are you so positive about the future? Don't you watch the news? And I said, President Clinton, I'm positive about the future for two reasons. One, no, I do not watch the news. <laughs> and second, I look at the data. And I want to hit the first one first, which is we're living in a day and age where the news media is a drug pusher. And on every device that you have, you're broadcast every piece of negative news on the planet over and over and over again. And there's a reason for this. As we were evolving in the savannas of Africa, our brains started paying 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news. And their job is to deliver your eyeballs to their advertisers. So you don't hear all the amazing news going on all the time. All you hear is the danger and the peril. And it changes the way you see the future. Your mindset is your most important asset. Please do not give that up to the Crisis News Network. If you look, that's CNN, by the way, um, <laughs> look at the evidence over the last 100 years, we've seen incredible shifts. Global income has doubled and tripled. Lifespan has doubled. The cost of food has dropped 20-fold. Energy has dropped 50-fold in price. Transportation, hundreds of folds. Communications, millions of fold in price. We forget how, world, how, the, how amazing this world truly is. Let's go back just 100 years. 100 years ago, in 1918, in one year, 16 million people died. In that same year, 500 million people were infected by the flu. 50 million people died. Imagine the headlines today if that happened. We forget how amazing the world we're living in today truly is. You know, back then, 6% of Americans had a high school degree. Right? Five days from London to New York, three and a half months from London to Australia. Eight percent of homes had a phone, right? Three minute phone call from Denver to New York was eleven dollars, while the average wage was twenty-two cents. We forget the extraordinary world that we're in. If you look forward, I want to give you a sense of how fast things are changing. This, in 1956, is a five megabyte hard drive, $120,000. <laughs> we noticed when this happened, right? When it's 25 times more memory, 1,000 times cheaper. But did you notice when this happened? When it's 1,000 times more memory for the same price, it doesn't slow down, right? Now it's a terabyte on something you can lose in your pocket. We're seeing a 10 trillion fold price, performance, volume, and improvement. Yet we don't think about this stuff, these amazing capabilities that we're gaining. Faster, cheaper computers. The oxygen in the room is driving all of these technologies, driving us towards a world of abundance. Technology is the force that takes anything that used to be scarce and makes it abundant over and over again. Right? Energy. We used to go and kill whales on the open ocean to get oil to light our night skies. Then we ravaged mountainsides for coal. Then we drilled kilometers under the ground for oil. And now we know the sun, the sun bathes the earth in 8,000 times more energy than we consume as a species in a year. Right? Abundant energy means abundant water, health, and learning. At the end of the day, it'll all be free for every single human on the planet. Just the same way access to all the information is free on Google or Baidu for the poorest child or the wealthiest child.
time, money, communications, resources, extraordinary progress towards abundance over and over again. This was from a couple of months ago off the coast of Japan in the silt on the ocean. We discovered enough rare earth metals to give us all the batteries and electric cars and computers we need for the next 400 years. There is nothing truly scarce, right? We're heading towards a world of amazing communications. 5G coming out in the next year. 10 to 100 gigabit connection speeds. Imagine downloading a movie in a fraction of a second. If that's not enough, Facebook and Google and OneWeb, and then on top of that, SpaceX with Starlink. We're heading towards a world where we're going from 3.8 billion, half the planet connected last year. In the next five years, we're going to connect every single person on this planet with gigabit connection speeds. Not like you and I got online at 9600 baud, right? So what does four billion new minds coming online mean? We're heading towards a world where every single person is empowered to find and solve problems. That's what gives me the greatest hope. We're creating a world where the best way to become a billionaire is help a billion people. The world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities. We're going to slay problem after problem after problem as we do. Because that's what we do. So the data, which I said to President Clinton, let's look at that data. Over the last 200 years, people living in extreme poverty has plummeted from 90%. We're going to be taking it out to zero very shortly. Literacy around the world has gone from 10% to near 90%. As a father of two seven-year-olds, I think about this. 200 years ago, half the children on the planet didn't make it to five years old. Right? It was a coin flip if your kids survive. What kind of life is that for a mother or a father? Today it's 4%, still too high. This is global average life expectancy. It's doubled. We're going to double it again very soon. Worried about overpopulation of planet Earth? Don't be. Two things reduce the population growth rates of cities and countries. You make them better educated and healthier, the growth rate plummets. Right? You can see the charts here. Look at what's going on in terms of natural catastrophe survival. What's going on in the 50s, 60s, 70s that drops the death rate after hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and such? It's spacecraft in orbit, better sensors, saving lives. This is from a friend's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Steven Pinker. He says, look, we are living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. Did you know that? The most peaceful time ever in human history. It's just that every single cell phone, every single headline blares death, destruction, because that's what gets your attention, because your brains, your amygdalas are wired to save your life by paying attention to negative news over positive news. At the end of the day, we're even seeing military budgets drop by 300%. Extraordinary. So why? Why is this happening? Why now? I guarantee you, we haven't gotten smarter. We haven't had hardware, software upgrades. It's not better politicians, that's for sure. It's the impact of these exponential technologies. These technologies are the force that uplift humanity. Take us from scarcity to abundance over and over again. By the way, if you'd like these slides, just email this, send any email, and you'll get these slides sent to you. We're going from a world where it used to be the king and the queen on the rooftops, right? And everybody else in extreme squalor to a world where we're going from a few haves to all these have-nots to a world, I believe, in the next 20 years, a world of abundance, where we can meet the needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. Yes, there's a wealth divide, but we're going from a world of have and have-nots to a world of haves and a world of super-haves. A world in which we can truly create a planet that is more peaceful, more prosperous, where we don't fight over survival, where we can take a vacation from survival and look 
to fulfill our greatest dreams. Ultimately, it's not about creating a world of luxury, but a world of possibility for every man, woman, and child on this planet. Thank you. In the past, when I've introduced Diane Francis, I've said that she has such a way of cutting through bullshit <laughs> and reducing even the most complex issues to clear sentences directly put that we should just let her run the country. <laughs> um, at the same time, when I considered who I could turn to in order to take on Peter's rosy view of the world, to take on all the people around Peter, singularity, and the whole notion of exponential technologies. Someone who could take on the overwhelming success of Amazon, and Google, and Facebook, and Netflix, and Uber, and B&B, and you know, that whole lot. I knew there was only one guy, one woman with the cojones to do this job, and it's <laughs> Diane Francis. Thank you. He's amazing, and he's amazing, right? This is the best conference in Canada, in my opinion, and this is the best proponent for tech in the world, in my opinion. No question. Um, technology and science will make the world a better place. That is the cover of Peter's fabulous book. It still is fabulous. I don't know whether you've updated, but it's as timely as ever. It's tremendous and it'll be on sale here, but I am with him. He is absolutely right that theoretically, there is no question that tech, any kind of tech, can save the world from itself. I'm concerned we're gonna get there. We're not gonna get there until there's more ethical transformation of the tech world and development of science and research and corporate behavior, and governmental behavior. There must be a moral, ethical, and security framework around transformative technologies. This is what Oppenheimer did after the first atomic bombs were dropped in Japan. He said, oh my god, we are going to be in extinct because this is going to spread everywhere and we're not going to survive it. So he got very much involved. In the case of biotech, genetic engineering, and artificial intelligence, there are no moral, ethical frameworks around these technologies. We are not aware of what countries, rogue states, non-state players that are very evil, or whatever you want to call them, are doing, or can they get access to, or can buy from, or steal from what's going on. We don't know what corporations are doing. This is the problem. Ethical frameworks are going to be the only way forward. The only way forward. Oppenheimer spent decades getting across to the countries of the world that we needed a non-proliferation mechanism, a framework to contain the nuclearization of the world. And we only, as a result of his efforts and since, we have contained the nuclearization of countries to only nine. It's still dangerous, it's always dangerous, but imagine if he had not done this, and there is a whole compliance network involving thousands of arrests, investigations every year that track and monitor the creation and the transmission and the trafficking of every material that goes into any kind of nuclear threat product or service. And it still goes on all the time ever since. If we had not done this, we would not be able to look forward to an age of abundance because we would be ex extinct. There are good models for what I'm trying to propose here, NASA. And Peter is one of the pioneers of the new space industry sector. He is one of the pioneers. And NASA is the model. NASA 
had an ethical framework imposed on itself from the beginning of its, its, its space exploration endeavors. It said, let's put a man on the moon, but we're not going to do it losing a single life. That put an ethical constraint on what kind of research they did, how sloppy they were, how they had to second guess. The result was they did it. It took discipline, diligence, decades, scientists, consultants, casts of hundreds of thousands of experts from all over the world in mathematics, engineering, science, psychology, and all kinds of things to come up with what the miracle getting the man to the moon represented. And nobody died. When there was a failing engineering-wise, they went back to the drawing boards. They reiterated it. They redid it. They tested ad nauseum. When something failed, there was a bloody commission involved. People were brought in. People were shuffled out. That is how you have to develop transformative technologies. So we have a roadmap. Decades of physical and psychological impact research before they put a person on top of that missile. That rigor is needed for artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and biotech, particularly CRISPR. Without that, we are putting the cart before the horse, and we could end up with a weapon of mass destruction out of either of these areas of, of technological advance that would destroy us, just like the atomic proliferation would have. We don't have that. Today, we have unaddressed ethical questions, which are very important. I won't read them. But playing off the second one, should, should systems be created that will destroy the livelihoods of human beings without alternatives in place? That is the most immediate one we have to address. You've all seen the fact is Artificial intelligence and IT destroys jobs and creates surplus workers. So rapidly, there may not be time to anticipate or plan unless there's a framework that controls the development and research of such things. We're at the beginning of the end of work, left unbridled. Everybody's seen this slide. It's Oxford, says 47% of jobs in the US are threatened by artificial intelligence replacing them or altering them or destroying them. The number in Canada is 45%. Recent, re, recent Institute, the Brook, Brookfield Institute did a study. 45% of jobs are threatened in the next 15 years. Just take one thing, robot cars, driverless vehicles, will destroy the truck driver. It's the number one job in 29 out of 50 states in the United States. These are breadwinner's jobs. This is not messing around. Are you just going to let vehicles be driverless? And, and what are you going to do with the surplus workers? This is a big ethical question that only a wise society addresses and only a framework can. Faced with this very same dilemma in 1589, Queen Elizabeth refused to patent an automatic weaving machine. Look at her quote, consider what the invention would do to my subjects. It would assuredly, he said to the inventor, she said to the inventor, make you very rich, sir, but it would bring them ruin by depriving them of employment, thus making them beggars. It was not patented for 200 more years. The king of France did the same thing. You have to give a society time to plan for such an event and make sure there are alternatives. None of that is being done. There's a cute little, cute little pilot projects here and there on universal basic income. Nothing is being done by any government. This one really bothers me. This picture, I think, is tragic. These are the two little cloned, first cloned primates in China, two little sisters clinging to each other. Look at their little cute faces. What is going to happen to them? The Chinese are promising that they won't do the other primates. They won't clone the other primates. If you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> if they don't do it, somebody may steal it from them or buy it from somebody. 
Genetic engineering is a famous photograph of a, a kitten whose embryo was fooled around with in a kitchen by some kids from MIT, and it glows in the dark. Cute trick. Allegedly doesn't do anything to the health of the animal, but why are we allowing uh, people to play around with embryos of anything? There's no laws, there's no regs, there's really no major control, and there's no ethical constraint. Thou shalt do this or thou shalt not. CRISPR. Recently, the medical uh, uh, fraternity or the regulators in the U.S. stopped some trials, human clinical trials that CRISPR wanted to do on genetic engineering. They're not stopping them, and yes, there's a lot of religious fighting over it, and yes, I know that's an impediment to progress, but these things have to be done deliberately and carefully, because otherwise you get barcode kids. And again, not to pick on the Chinese, because I'm sure it's going on in other jurisdictions, but human embryos, called zygotes, are being edited in China. Human embryos. They say that these are embryos that will not come to term. If you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. Why are they doing it if they're not going to do more? So right now, all we have in the world is, in my opinion, three tech frameworks or templates that are in place right now. They've emerged. Number one, good old United States, the Wild West. Anything goes. Permissive, unregulated. We have tech giants who spy on us, take our data without our permission, don't tell us who's they're, who they're selling to, monetizing it by selling it to the highest bidder, including Russians you know, hiding behind whatevers, and no curation of content. YouTube has been responsible for broadcasting some of the worst hate, libel, and terrorist, pro-terrorist uh, videos ever. They're cleaning it up. They're trying to clean it up. They're saying they're going to filter it. Don't believe it. Google owns YouTube. And then, of course, there's the infamous Facebook. And Zuckerberg, who said, you know, in the tech world, you can't always see what's going to happen in the future. Just get on with it and break it, and then fix it afterwards. Well, let's see if he fixes the fact that the 2016 election was manipulated, or the Brexit referendum, or Macron's uh, reputation was smeared because of Facebook postings that were allowed, that Facebook allowed. That says all you need to know. The Wild West model of the United States allows snake oil salesmen and hate and libel to be posted. They're trying to clean it up because they're a little embarrassed after the election and the Russian stuff. But, you know, look at that. They pollute the internet. They go out and find the morons for me. Now, they're starting to get a little more responsible. Broadcasters and newspapers have truth and advertising requirements. You can't just let snake oil be advertised. So at least they have the decency recently, both Google, YouTube, and Facebook, to crack down on the cryptocurrency stuff that's being thrown all over the place. So those ads are being banned for the moment. There's a lot of fraud in that, in that space. The second model is the European Union, the 28 countries. They're very, you know, laborious in how they do things, but they are the first region to come up with regulations to protect consumers and society. And here are some of them. Again, I, my slides are available to anyone. These are what they've attacked, all the things that should have been attacked a long time ago and aren't in the laissez-faire world of tech. Robot ethics and liability, privacy protection, all kinds of things. And then there's China. In 2020, Big Brother becomes reality. They are building out the world's biggest surveillance system, an internet of things for 1.4 billion people. 600 million cameras with facial recognition software. In public places, private places, workplaces, in businesses, wherever they can put them. That policewoman has eyeglasses that have facial recognition software for law enforcement. Yes, it's important to have law enforcement with this kind of a system, 
But what they're doing is all the data, everything you do, everything about you is flowing into one national rating system, and they're giving people a FICO score, three-digit, based on their lifestyle. It's a behavioral modification tool as well as surveillance. So if you go to an old people's home for an afternoon and help them, in some of the pilot projects, you'll get 100 points. If you give a pint of blood, you'll get six points. If you don't look after your parents, you'll be deducted 200. If you get fired, if you cheat, if you jaywalk, all of this stuff is being micromanaged by the Chinese government in two years' time. That's what a FICO score on your phone will look like. If you get up to 831 points, boy, you've hit it big. You now get free gym facilities. You get visas. You, they waive your visas for international travel. You get fast-tracked into hotels. You get discounts on loans. You get discounts on airplane fares. If, conversely, you're down on the 1 or 200 level, forget about your kids getting into a good school, forget about getting on a train sometimes, you're back at the line. 11 million Chinese have been denied airfare in punishment for a low score. I call it Big Brother Meets Air Miles. <laughs> so we have the three frameworks, and I don't like any of them, and you shouldn't either. We need a global one for starters. We need a Robert Oppenheimer to say, we will all potentially die from something that's run away by a rogue group if we don't get our arms around this. Thank you. The theory of the debate is that each side had 10 minutes to put their case before we went on stage. Diane came up and said, I need an extra two minutes. I said, Diane, we haven't even started. You want to break the rules. Why? She said, I'm a girl. <laughs> I said, that works for me. So now we have the rebuttal phase, and each speaker is allotted seven minutes. Peter, you can have a little six more. Okay, no, no, I'll, and you can have an extra couple minutes if you need it, so each will reply in turn. First, Peter, in reply to Diane. Thank you, Martin. Diane, always a pleasure. Um, it's, uh, so, if the debate is technology, promise, or peril, it's a false debate, right? All technology from the rock to fire offers promise and peril. It's always both. The point that I want to make here that I think is so important is that we demonize technology. We talk about it negatively. No one forces any of us here to use technology, right? We can throw away our cell phones, our TVs, our cars, and do none of that. It just, we use it because it makes our life better. We're all born with the same 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. That's the only thing that makes us all common. It's how we use that time. And for me, technology is about using that time more efficiently to do the things that I desire, to increase happiness, to increase connection. So it's not about one or the other. It is both. My point here is for all of us to see the incredible promise that technology brings us. That we're finally alive in a time where it's not the king or the queen or the government that has to solve that problem that has been bothering you, that you're pissed at. It's we can do that. We now have access as individuals to all the computational power, all the knowledge, more capital than ever before in human history access to AI, 3D printing on the cloud. At the end of the day, what do you want to do? Because you can do it. And I think it flips the model, the sense of responsibility is on us to stop complaining and stop doing. We are more empowered than ever before. And that power doesn't come out of no place. It comes out of the technology that we're building, that we're creating. And I think the most important thing for me to share with you is this knowledge that the world is getting better at an extraordinary rate on almost every single measure. And when you're only seeing the negative news, you're forgetting that. 
We romanticize the past when life was short and brutish and the average age for men 100 years ago was 40. You'd, you know, most of you would not be here. So, is there problems? Of course. I'm not, you know, naive enough to think over the last 100 years, even as all of these metrics have gotten better and better and better, we still had World War I, World War II, the Spanish flu, the Vietnam War, the Depression. 150 million people died over the last century. But I would argue that as a society, we are far better off today. I would much rather be alive today than 100 years ago. And the problems that we face now, we're more empowered than ever before to handle them. You see, our brains, the 100 billion neurons in our brain, the 100 trillion synaptic connections in our minds, have evolved so that we see the dangers far away. We're really great meaning-making machines, pattern-making machines. We detect the danger far away. And we accelerate it to the future and say, holy shit, we got a problem. But we forget that as we move forward, we are inventing the technologies to solve those problems. Right? A hundred years ago, the biggest environmental problem that we had in major cities was horse manure. As people moved from the, you know, the rural areas into the urban areas, they brought with them their motive force, the horse. And as the populations in cities grew, so did the horse manure. And the projections were decimating. Disease was following. But then something happened. We invented the car. And the horse population just went off a cliff. And today, we're doing that again, right? We're heading towards an all-electric economy. Autonomous cars, electric cars. In fact, forget about cars altogether. We're going to use avatars and virtual reality to go from point to point. Technology gives us the power to solve every single problem. There is no problem we cannot solve. I agree with you, Diane, about ethics and morals. Absolutely. But here's the other point. They change. They change over time, right? I'm a medical doctor, and everyone come to me for anything medical. Moses was right, I made my parents happy. I had two, two companies going my fourth year in medical school. I sent them a copy of my diploma, and I went and focused on International Space University and my rocket company. <laughs> I wish it were funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, if I went back in time to my great-great-great-great-grandparents in ancient Greece and said to them, listen, my grandfather who's dying of a cardiomyopathy here, that guy who got gored by a bull, I'm going to take his dead heart out and transplant it into my great-great-great-great-grandfather. It would have been the work of the devil. Today it's a miracle. Ethics and morals change over time. Over and over again, we have to realize that. The problem is the institutions that we have, you know, people don't like change, right? We like waking up in the morning and thinking the world is exactly the same as it was the night before. And our government, our religious institutions, their job is stabilization. But as exponential technology is doing this and government is trying to hold it down, that's where the challenge is. I agree on the issue of technological unemployment. It's one of the areas that concerns me. I've partnered with Tony Robbins and we're holding an annual event to talk about solutions there. But I want to flip the conversation slightly. The reality is most of the jobs that we'll lose in the beginning are those that are dull, dangerous, or dirty. Very few people begin life saying, I want to clean toilets or be at the cash register. We all have dreams but then reality hits us, and we take the job that is available. Technology has the ability to uplift us, to allow us to pursue our dreams, to take a vacation from survival, and to begin to see what is possible. The other thing we have to realize is that we tend to project ourselves as we are today. But we're heading towards a future we are, we're, we're not going to be as we are. We're merging with technology. 
right? Ray Kurzweil's prediction is the year 2033, 2035. It's not about AI versus humans. As my friend Brian Johnson says, it's going to be about AI versus HI. It's going to be us augmented. It's us connecting with the cloud. It's us becoming a multicellular species. It's us becoming a meta-intelligence. We are evolving as a human race. We're evolving at an extraordinary rate. We're going from evolution by natural selection, which can call Darwinism, to evolution by human direction. You can try and stop it, you cannot believe it, but it is where we're going. This has been, the, you know, it has been this way since the beginning of time. So, at the end of the day, for me, of course, it's both promise and peril. But I believe there is incontrovertible evidence that technology is making the world a safer, healthier, more uplifting place. The millions of lives, no, the billions of lives we're taking out of poverty, where those children don't have a coin flip to live past age five. You tell all of them that we should stop technology, right? This is what's allowing us to feed the planet, to give us clean drinking water, to make the cost of energy effectively free, information effectively free. This is the world that I'm working towards, a world where all of these technologies are creating abundance for every single human on this planet, not just for the wealthiest. Yes, we're going from a world of have and have nots to a world of haves, and yes, there'll be some super haves, but that's okay. I'd make that trade over and over and over again so every mother knows that her children can have the healthiest possible life the most educated life, a life of potential. This is what technology is giving us. Do we have obligations to use it you know, responsibly? Yes, absolutely. But the alternative of saying technology is bad, shut it down, is not an alternative. So I leave it to you and say technology for me is one of the most important forces in humanity today for uplifting eight billion people. It's the only tool we have for uplifting eight billion people. Thank you. He's so good. <laughs> And he's so correct. I, I'm not here to discount or poo-poo the fact that the kind of technologies that Peter and others have helped foster and bring, bring to light are, are not amazing. Uh, but I think we have to differentiate between the conversation in the first world and in the rest of the world. You go to Africa and you say to a little boy, you know, I can get you a cell phone that can help your little sister how to read. And he says, no, I just want the bribes so that we can get electricity. I just want bribes so I can get electricity for my hut. We are talking about a human nature, maybe. We are talking about humans who are badly disorganized, who are organized on the basis of power, violence, exploitation. We've got to be realistic about that, and Peter is. And I know what he's saying. In some ways, the abundance, when it comes and is available, will help bring down some of those institutions, undermine them, help people not have to accede to them and be under their control. And all of that is good. But then, as I say, the overarching problem is that we see the brilliance of these technologies. We don't know what's, what's being cooked up in labs. We don't know what kind of genetic engineering is going on. We should know, because there will be a potential for mass destruction or negative impact on the whole planet if we don't get our hands around that AI and biotech and genetic 
engineering globally as we have with nuclear power. Because we wouldn't be here today if Mr. Oppenheimer hadn't said, wow. And it's no surprise he was a graduate of a high school, a very unique high school in Manhattan called the Ethics High School. And Ray Kurzweil went to it as well. So ethics is not a moving target. We all know right from wrong. We know the dangers. Let's just make sure that everybody who is working in these spaces is contained, monitored, compliant on a global basis uh, from that, by some framework. And it's worked with nuclear. As I say, we would have been long gone. And I think it can work going forward. And that also includes saying sometimes, as they did in NASA, instead of rushing to put a man on the moon and killing a bunch of astronauts on the way, they didn't kill one to get the guys there, the guys there. It was a remarkable achievement of ethical, smart, sustainable engineering, science, and technology. And that's what we have to apply to AI, and we have to apply to biotech. And so I completely agree, we've got to move forward on tech, but sometimes that may mean, you know what, the driverless car is going to be so, truck is going to be so bloody disruptive, let's give everybody a pause, wait five years, and retrain people. Maybe that's what we do. And so, you know, we need to know how to plan the future, and we need compliance, and we need a framework. So, you've done your work standing. I suggest you do we, both. Do we arm wrestle now? Yeah, well, take can, a can I, spot can, close can I, one to sec, each one sec, other. Would you, would you come over here, Diane, one second? Yeah, so we're going to get a selfie. selfie. Get the selfie. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. That's okay. great. Okay, why don't you guys wait you here and, yeah, the yeah. The I think you should sit next to each other. Yeah, sure, of course. Okay. All right, so now we have this panel of uh, C3 commentators, critics, and cross-examiners. The first is Salim Ismail. Salim was the first executive director of the then nascent Singularity University, which is where I met him. He then went on to become a speaker, a writer, a consultant, trying to help various corporations around the world deal with disruption and possibly remake themselves as newborn exponential organizations. His technique is to first scare everybody to death, <laughs> then he offers them a little tough love. This is Salim Ismail. Let's hear your comments on what has transpired. Thank you, Moses. I'm, uh, I'm very torn on this, uh, which side of this to go on. Uh, Diane's kind of like an elder sister to me, um, and I'm godfather to Peter's kids, so which, where, where do you go with this? Um, I want to make some comments around where we think this goes, though, and I want to lift up a level and talk about what's actually happening in the world and why the stress is there. Uh, we see this extraordinary uh, pace of change with technology, and one way I frame it is, you know, in the 15th century, we had the Gutenberg moment, and the printing press changed everything. I argue today we have 20 such Gutenberg moments hitting us at the same time. Uh, just autonomous cars changes everything, right? Then you add blockchain, then you add solar, then you add AI, CRISPR, robotics, uh, breakthroughs in neuroscience. We have never seen this before in the history of mankind. In the past, you had one technology accelerating, one big breakthrough. It, just the Gutenberg moment took about 100 years for society to absorb it. And it was actually the most violent century uh, following in the history of mankind. And so uh, technology is moving, and it's going to break every institution. And part of the reason that Diane makes her points is that we can see every institution in the world breaking. All of the institutions, all the mechanisms that we use to run society, uh, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, uh, healthcare, education, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, right? not for today. Definitely not for a trillion sensors coming down the pike. We actually need to re-architect every single one of those. Um, let me give a couple of examples to bring the point home. Uh, education. Uh, all of our education systems pretty much globally are designed to take a young child, train them through their early 20s to be ready for the existing job market. Right? Except we have no idea what a job looks like in five years. What are we teaching them? 
Right? That's the starting point. When we found at Singularity University is if you're doing today a master's degree in some of the topics that we cover, like advanced robotics or neuroscience or biotech, literally by the time you finished your master's degree, you're out of date. So that's a structural issue. Our ability to teach the, the material can't keep pace with the changes in the material subject and the subject area. Or you take religion. Most religions are designed to, you know, the business model is to sell heaven. As we have life extension coming, how, what happens to the business model of most religions is going to be an interesting uh, challenge. But the, most of them are based on absolute truths, assumptive truths that don't change, are designed not to change, and to keep society stable. Yet the world is moving very, very quickly. And we need to completely agree that we need to completely evolve our, our mechanisms and our regulatory structures. Uh, exponential government is an oxymoron. Right? And so we have to fix these. Uh, now, you take a couple more areas. Take the institution of marriage. Uh, I've, I've made this comment a couple of times before. We invented marriage about 9,000 years ago. And when marriage first surfaced as an institution, average lifespan was about 25 years old. So you got married, you had kids, and you died. It is not an institution that is designed to last 50, 60 years. Um, that is state-sanctioned torture, is basically what it is, right? Um, we, are, we are about to double human lifespan, according to Peter. And so are you supposed to live with the same person for 100 years? You know, it, it's really, this is the stress around it. Now, the problem that we have, and, and you could go on like this, and you see the stress in the world today across all of our institutions. Uh, representative democracies, we invented that. Uh, when information was scarce. If you're in Ottawa or Washington, D.C., you did not know what was happening in California or in British Columbia. The speed of a horse was as fast as you could find out. So you had a representative come and say, here's what my people are thinking. And of course, today we have an abundance of information that gets misused, misinterpreted, fake. Every major democracy in the world is broken. Right? India broken, Brazil is broken, the UK broke recently, the US breaking in front of our eyes. And you see the stress, maybe the most today in fundamental uh, movements in most religions, the orthodox element in almost every religion is freaking out, saying we can't take this pace of change. Let's go back to an older time when things were better. And to Peter's point, people would much rather be comfortable than happy. Right? And so we kind of ache for those that kind of comfort level that it gives us to try and go back to an older time. And that's not really the answer either, because technology will not slow down. The big challenge we have as we try and update these institutions is we have to solve the amygdala problem, which Peter talks about, which is an individual level can somewhat be addressed with mindset, at the worst, generational change. But the real challenge, I think, is really at our institution levels or in our organizations or in society, if you try and attempt disruptive innovation or introduce new ideas, you get an immune system response. And the antibodies attack you. You try and update education, the teachers' unions go crazy. You try and update uh, transportation, you have the fight between Uber and the taxis. Um, Uber is successful by deliberately breaking the law, leapfrogging to public acceptance and waiting for policy to catch up. Right? Not very pleasant as a process, but you can't argue the success in that sense. And so we have to figure that part out. How do you update uh, and rewire all of our institutions from the ground up? And that's the work I think we need to do. Uh, because I tend to be very optimistic in, in the sense of a Ray Kurzweil kind of thinking. He once said that technology is the major, a major driver of progress in the world. Maybe it's the only major driver, in, uh, driver of progress in the world. And now that we have a dozen technologies moving at kind of this incredible doubling pattern that we've never seen before, it, it's totally appropriate to be bubbly, excited, and, and fascinated by what comes along. Cancer will largely be handled in the next few years. Alzheimer's very shortly after that. The world has lived in a scarcity of energy for the entire history of society. Uh, we're about to have abundant energy. And to Peter's point, that allows you to have free desalinization. Uh, free desalinization means clean water. Clean water means we take out 60% of the infectious diseases in the world. And so this is the opportunity we have. Diane makes a great point. Let's pause on autonomous cars. But in that five-year pause, if we wait five years, six million people will die because we kill 1.2 million people in car accidents around the world today, about 34,000 people in the US. Maybe the weirdest, most fascinating statistic I've heard about autonomous cars, in the US, 50% of all legal court cases come from car accidents, 50%. So you automate the car, you take out all the lawyers. How can that be bad, right? That'll work out, <laughs> that should work out really, really well. Um, and I wanna uh, kind of close out on two points. One is, 
when, you know, today we have some interesting capabilities to observe and study what's happening with technology. So we have systems like eBay, Craigslist, Kijiji, uh, where we can actually study what is the actual ratio of people doing good versus bad. We kind of build our regulatory systems, we have uh, uh, um, laws and so on to try and protect people from the negative aspects of technology or from malintent. Um, but on eBay, I can just as easily do a positive transaction as a negative one. Or same with Craigslist, same with Kijiji. So anthropologists and, uh, and sociologists have studied these systems now to say, okay, here's an equal opportunity to do good or bad. What's the actual ratio? And the actual ratio turns out to be something like 8,000 to 1. So on eBay, there are 8,000 positive transactions for every negative. And if that's the case, we should take something like drones and let anybody do whatever they want with it. You'll get 8,000 positive use cases for every negative one. You can then police the negative, and society benefits incredibly. Instead, what we do do is say, ban all drones, and slowly open that tap as technology pervades. And it takes far too long to get the benefits of, the, the of these technologies. We already have evidence that if you drive the um, a Tesla autonomously, more lives are saved because there are that many less accidents, that many more fatal less fatalities because of that. So we have a profound opportunity here to really embrace, but we have an obligation. Um, I've lived all over the world. I'm actually Canadian, uh, originally from India, and I think Canada has an incredible opportunity today with the practical thinking uh, to really revamp and transform all of our institutions. We have diversity, we have creativity, and I think it's not even an opportunity. I think of it as an obligation. Because if you look at civilizations of the past, uh, the Romans, the Incans, the Mayans, they all got to a specific level of complexity, hit a wall, and because they couldn't adapt, they literally, every single one of them crashed. And we're about to hit that wall today. We're just starting to push against the edges of it. And we have to figure out how to naturally cascade through and go through this big shift from scarcity to abundance in an elegant way, otherwise we have actually existential threat. So I lift above uh, the two commentaries and I say, yeah, technology is a major driver. We cannot slow it down or stop it. We have to figure out how to manage it more elegantly. Thank you very much. So next we have Rob Nail who is CEO of Singularity University and is driving an intense program of worldwide expansion for the activities of that estimable new institution. However, as an educator, um, his views are a little more nuanced, and I want to read you a quote of his. He says, intellectual rigor requires that some of the blowback and collateral damage must be addressed with honesty and clarity. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Moses. <clears throat> so somehow, somehow in my career, I continuously follow this cast of characters in various uh, functions and roles. Um, and it's really tough to see some of the things that they're here. Moses, this is, this is for you. I think there's one very specific debater missing here, um, and if you haven't been reading the news, which Peter tries not to. Uh, IBM on Monday night had a little debate in San Francisco, uh, and it was an AI debater, which is a pretty exciting new thing. Um, turned out that uh, AI platform did quite well against some pretty notable debaters in this little format. So this time next year, Moses. Um, it would be very interesting to have a debate about technology and humanity with technology. <laughs> right, because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Given, given the progress of AI, it means I'd be able to fire all of you. We're right? all fired, yeah. exactly. <laughs> We're all fired. Well, and that's a great point, because that strikes at our fear of technology. And, and IBM had to be very clear that their goal is not to fire everyone and replace us all. It really is about augmentation. These technologies are completely about helping us be more human and progress. And everything that you've heard from Peter and all the news you read, I would suggest nothing is different today than any other time. 
We, we humans have a unique capability to look at a problem and be driven to solve it. I think that's one of the most extraordinary things about humanity. And when faced with a problem, we invent a new solution, a technology, and we progress. Peter showed you the endless number of slides and evidence of how we've progressed as humanity. By every metric we have of progress, technology has helped us move forward. What's interesting is when that new technology comes online, we change our behaviors. We start acting different. Maybe our ethics and morals shift a little bit. And now we're faced with a whole new landscape, a new horizon of problems and challenges that need to be solved. And we look to the entrepreneurs and the inventors and the leading thinkers to come up with new ways to solve them. And hence the wheel continues to go. I do not think this is any different than how it's always progressed, and I do not think it will change anytime soon. What feels different is the pace is accelerating. We're talking about exponential technologies, which means our capability to adapt to how fast this wheel is turning is getting increasingly difficult. And so we need a different mindset to think about technologies, different tools and resources, and a different kind of network of how to make sure that it's going where we want it to go. Because as you've heard from Diane, this wheel can take us off some pretty steep cliffs. And we're definitely racing forward there in some interesting ways. I'm, I'm definitely concerned about our vision for the future, which is why I'm as passionate as I am about running Singular University. The, the vision for the long-term future that we're creating if you read the news and media or you watch a movie from Hollywood, the story of the future is increasingly a dystopian Hunger Games zombie apocalypse. <laughs> right? And I don't want that future, personally. And if we're bombarded with all of these new breakthroughs and news articles that basically say, hey, look, Amazon Go is going to destroy all retail jobs, period. End of story we're left just terrified. And if we don't have a framework for actually looking at technology and, and forecasting where it's going and, and having any kind of sense that we know how to direct it, it leaves us in a deep sense of anxiety. And we end up making decisions out of this state of fear. I will suggest that the world is deeply reeling from a, la a lack of a long-term positive vision of the future of abundance that we can create, and a framework for dealing with this accelerating pace of change. And so the rise of populism, Trump, Brexit, is a very natural result of making decisions out of fear. And we're gonna see a lot more of that unless we can start changing the construct and a mindset around technology and, and articulate the long-term positive future that we could create, one of abundance. Now, one thing I'll, I will suggest, I'm concerned that that might not be possible. As you heard from Peter, our brain evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and drives us directly. Flight or fear, uh, fight or flight responses to negative news, that's a really specific thing. But can we live in a world that it has abundance of resources and opportunities? Which is one we, I believe we can create. But can our human biology deal with that future of abundance? I would say the rise of obesity is a great example where we have an abundance of food in the US and many other countries, and we can't seem to deal with it very well. Right? There's the one example of abundance. And if you think about the massive changes we're about to endeavor, are we going to be able to adapt to them to create a positive future? And I'm, I'm not totally sure at the moment. I'm, I'm deeply concerned that we're on a, on a path where we may just manifest that dystopian future because we have a lot of work and a lot of social and political courage to change every system that we're operating under to allow for a different future to arise. Um, one of the interesting challenges we also have is the question about who's in control of these technologies. Peter has a great framing of looking at exponential te technologies, the six Ds. As technologies become digitized, they rapidly, they're very deceptive and disruptive. 
because they dematerialize, demonetize, and democratize products and services very quickly. So as technology is democratized, it means it gets in everyone's hands. It means CRISPR technology, genetic engineering of humans, is everywhere. The labs re-engineering human embryos are in the US, in Brazil, in, Can in China, and in Canada. You, you will find out. They're, they're research. They're doing important research about the future of humanity. Exponential technologies are very hard to control because they're rapidly democratized. When you talk about the future of humanity, who controls it? Because the ethics and morality of China versus the US versus Canada versus the Middle East are radically different. Who decides? Singularity University's goal is to bring the world together, to have very important, critical conversations and productive ones with diverse global mindsets, looking at technology, looking far forward, and deciding how do we want to steer it. Thank you. We're building up a little on that side of the couch. Uh, I'm sorry. I, noticed. I didn't know which side it was on. Sorry, Moses. <laughs> and now, for something uh, completely different, we're going to bring on stage Matthew Fisher. Matthew actually has been with us for the last couple of years, and he's different in the sense that uh, he's uh, one of the last foreign correspondents still working in Canada. He's uh, reported from 162 different countries over 35 years, but a lot of his reporting has involved conflict zones, military matters, and that is his perspective that he's going to pursue right now. Uh, thank you, Moses, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Listening to these extremely articulate people, I see merit in all of their arguments. Uh, Peter, there's an inevitability about the future. These things will happen because man grasps things and wants to go forward. I, I agree with Diane because we don't have systems to watch, also alluded to by another speaker. We don't have systems to watch over any of this. And what I'd like to be is sort of the canary in the, the coal mine in terms of warnings about the worst aspects, potentially, of artificial intelligence. And that is things like uh, artificial intelligence informed killer drones. Uh, the United Nations has a word for it. Their ex exact terminology is lethal autonomous weapons systems. So they have a term for it, but there are no guidelines, let alone rules, uh, no international treaties governing anything to do with artificial intelligence and what it might mean in the military sphere. The UN has discussed this now for about 10 years and has got absolutely nowhere on it. Uh, and also, as you will know, even in Canada, uh, there's no public discussion of such issues at all. I don't think Canadians are particularly aware that even in the last few months, Canada has created a cyber battalion within the Canadian Armed Forces. They are charged not only with defensive cyber warfare, but also they, if it is necessary, will be able to conduct offensive cyber warfare operations. It's not something that the public discusses at all. And of course, Canada is a very small player in all of this. The United States actually has a cyber command. It was created in 2009. Uh, it's now much, much larger. And then each of the branches of the US forces has it. And of course, China and Russia have uh, very large uh, cyber uh, commands. Uh, I'm just trying right now to digest cyber warfare, and already we're moving on to artificial intelligence warfare. Uh, over the last 20 years, the first time I even heard of drones was in 1999, and I literally heard one. I was in Kosovo, and overhead there were US surveillance drones. By the time I arrived five or six years later in Afghanistan, there were predator drones followed by reaper drones. The Canadians had heron drones, so did the Australians. Those are built in Israel. And it was a totally different ballgame. I saw, at a guess, 500 uh, killer drones take off from the Kandahar airfield. Maybe it was a thousand. I also saw the drones go up in the air that were hunting for bin Laden. 
Uh, and uh, this had no AI component that I'm aware of, but it's to tell you that just in a very, very short period of time, we moved all this way, and now we're moving into artificial intelligence. Other speakers have referred to the fact that uh, everything is moving so fast. Well, I can tell you it's moving that way too in warfare. Uh, the drones that carry out these attacks are flown by pilots at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, just outside of Las Vegas. So when they carry out a, an attack in Yemen or in Iraq or in Afghanistan, it is fellows and women who go home and play golf or play with their kids 30 minutes after zapping people uh, with a button with basically a very high-tech video game. Uh, when you add in the artificial intelligence component, uh, it it's may make the system uh, go on steroids. Right now, we don't only have drones uh, that carry out these things, but we have drones now that refuel drones in the air. We have drones that are submarines that are being developed, that will have no men aboard. There are ships with drones. Uh, I visited uh, the high-tech establishment in Israel at the Tel Aviv airport, where they have maybe 50 different types of drones in a room, some as small as bumblebees. And their job is to go up and literally peer into rooms and listen to conversations and take photographs. Companies can use this, militaries can use this to see who's talking, who's meeting. And then, of course, there are the bigger drones. What happens when they are starting to deal with machines that are collecting massive amounts of data? The F-35 fighter jet is a fused system that has been developed so that 10, 20, 40 of them at the same time in the air will have all the information coming together in one point. Every pilot will see what all 30 or 40 other aircraft see at one time. Their whole idea in terms of defending the North American continent is that those aircraft will be over Canadian airspace doing these kind of things. And we have no framework yet to deal w with a lot of these things. Uh, and questions that n nobody really seems to be asking in the military sphere is how is artificial intelligence going to f fit in? Uh, who is going to program these machines? Who's giving them orders? Right now, human beings still give the orders to uh, the drones that are carrying out these activities. But what, when, uh, what is it when these decisions are based on facial recognition and then uh, computers crunching data and telling the drone to kill somebody? Uh, there'll be no sentimentality in the process. There's, there's going to be no human bias. There's going to be no conscience. It'll be just pure mathematics that decides uh, who, who lives and who dies. Millions and millions of dollars are being spent on this. Just in the past couple of weeks, artificial intelligence from reading US sources, open sources, uh, suggests that uh, probably half a billion dollars ha have been earmarked just in the past few weeks to concentrate on this. The reason the Americans are so interested, we heard this a bit in the Cold War about the Soviet Union, is that they are terrified that China is ahead of them. And now they want massive resources to go into this uh, because of that reason. Uh, with everything happening so much faster, why do you need a human in the system? If the information that you're getting with thousands of different sources, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, I was watching what the drones had, and they could read license plates, and they could read faces. Now, of course, we've heard what China is doing with things like facial recognition. Will it be at some point the machines that decide uh, who sh should live and who should die? I, I, I would close by saying that one of the greatest American thinkers these days is the Defense Secretary, uh, Jim Mattis, and he didn't believe in artificial intelligence having much influence in the sphere until uh, uh, earlier this year when finally he changed everything in his own thinking when he said that he believed artificial intelligence is going to f uh, change the fundamental nature of warfare in the future. And we've got to think about this, the UN has to think about this, and believe me, the elephant in the room really is China. And China has to think about this, and it has been suggested they're operating right now outside the rules of law in the South China Sea and what they build up, and we must think about how we are going to talk to China about these things, because if we don't, things could get out of control 
in a big hurry and maybe just machines programmed by the Chinese will be making decisions according to totally different moral ideas than the ones that we have. Anyway, thanks a lot. So our next speaker is Ramona Pringle. Ramona actually has a little bit of history with Idea City. She was the host of a parallel online conference that we ran for many years. Thank you very much, Ramona. My pleasure. It's nice to be back. She's a professor at Ryerson University and also a commentator and columnist for the CBC these days. Talking about these very issues. Away you go. These very complicated issues. Well, I can't... Uh, I can't compete with everything that we've heard. I'm impressed, I'm uh, amazed by some of the things, I'm nervous about some of the things, but I think that the opportunity that I have uh, in front of this crowd today is to be your representative, is to talk about this as a, a person, as a human, and really as an educator, this is my job. Uh, in my role as a columnist, a technology columnist, this is my job, is breaking down the hype and breaking down the tech jargon. So you'll see, I may be, no, I'm not the only one who brought their smartphone up on screen, but I am never very far away from this. Uh, and I imagine that that's true of most of the people in this room. So. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so let me just see, we'll use our paddles for a second, because I know uh, we wanted to put those to good use. Let me see, Green, if you own a smartphone. If there's anyone who, ha let's see Red if, if you don't have a smartphone, maybe that'll be easier to get a sense. So what we know is that there's definitely uh, as many people who have two smartphones, as there are people who have none in this room. In fact, there's over two billion uh, cell phones around the world. There's more phones than there are people, which gives us a sense of where we're at. Now, because I always have my phone in my hand, I jokingly call myself a cyborg. Uh, you know, it's, we've outsourced this part of our brains. But in a sense, it's not that we're cyborgs, we're superheroes. And we talk about superheroes as being able to have superhuman strength or being able to have superhuman speed. We don't necessarily think about what's uh, inside of these phones as superhuman, and yet, when's the last time you uh, memorized a phone number? I will tell you, I don't know my husband's phone number because I had a smartphone when we met, and it's a piece of my brain that I don't need to use. I've outsourced it. Same thing with maps and in, with directions. And as we get more access to information and more access to these tools, we are becoming superheroes. And no wonder it is so engaging, so incredible to us as people. And this is really breaking it down. There's a conceptual conversation about the appeal and where we're headed and some of the concerns. But thinking about us and why we're using this is a really huge part to this conversation. Now, we are in this era of disruption, and the previous speakers have done a, a remarkable job of painting a picture of the world that we're in. But really, just in terms of this moment where we're at, there's Amazon stores that don't have clerks because they're uh, entirely manned by uh, technology. We've got uh, companies from Uber to Tesla competing to bring self-driving cars to the market. Uh, When's the last time you used a travel agent, right? Kayak is already, and all the competitors have done a, a, an a amazing job in terms of wiping out that whole uh, field in terms of jobs. In Japan, there's a, a hotel, probably more novelty, but that's entirely manned by humanoid robots. So this is the era that we're in. But instead of talking about, talking about the technology, I want to talk about uh, people. Now, all of this can be very scary, uh, rightfully so. You know, we hear headlines, there's reports that say in the next five years, oops, well, we'll get there. In the next five years, we're gonna uh, be seeing a tidal wave of disruption. And that's scary, right? That is the 40 to 70% in some industries job displacement that we're gonna hear about. But that's happened before, right? That happened uh, in the first industrial revolution that's gonna happen again with this new second machine age. And if we wanna be optimists, there is an argument to be made that it frees us up to do some of the innately human things, to be more creative, to use our uh, creative skills, but also, empathy and compassion. You know, we know we need more caretakers for the elderly. We need more nurses. Our classes have 30 to 40 students for every teacher. These are skills that we don't want robots doing, that we want humans doing, and we could use those humans. This is what we want to be retraining them for, is that which is innately ours. 
Uh, but when I talk about it being about people, this is also where I get nervous. You know, Peter said we demonize technology. Uh, I'm not scared of the technology. I'm scared of the people. I'm scared of the programmers. You know, every single time there's been a technology throughout history that has the capability of causing harm, we've used it to cause harm. So it's not really the technology that I want to focus on so much. I'm going to race through some of this because I know time is tight and really what we want to get to is this conversation that's coming. But if I can uh, share my approach to technology so that it helps you think about all of these issues, I like to zoom out and zoom in. You know, uh, 10 years ago when I started as a prof working as a professor, I used to get calls from the media saying, comment on this story, comment on that story. And it was always, you know, the new iPhone, the latest gadget. And I said, no, there's, there's another story we need to be talking about. We need to be talking talking about how this is going to change our relationship with our tools, with each other, with the world around us. And that's what zooming out does. It gives us the bird's eye view. It lets us look back as we look forward. But we also need to zoom in. And this is what I'm hoping to do in terms of the representative of you in this room. What is the appeal of these devices? The appeal is not the gadget. It's not that shiny screen. If you have any a child under the age of one, I guarantee you that shiny screen is going to smash within a, a week of getting it, and unfortunately, probably within a week of getting it repaired as well. Uh, the, the appeal is each other. Now, what's complicated about all of this is that we've got corporations that are cashing in on these innately human drives to connect and to become better versions of ourselves, to have more access to information, to have more access to each other. And that's where we get to this uh, complicated, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said it, it's a complicated relationship that we've got with Facebook, with all of technology. Uh, nothing is straightforward anymore. Uh, you know, there was this argument uh, about um, abundance and obesity. Well, that again comes back to a, a people issue. You know, there's the abundance, the problem with obesity isn't an abundance of uh, fruits and vegetables, it's an abundance of mass produced sugary, fatty foods that are in the easiest aisles to access, that are cheaper to buy than anything else. It's the decisions we make uh, for ourselves, for our communities, that are really uh, the problems. I'm going to keep skipping uh, forward here, but again, another one of those issues, you know, when we talk about how we're merging with technology or how the inevitability isn't going to be people versus uh, machines, there's more ethical issues that are going to arise. Everyone's been in, a, in um, grade school and you know that if you didn't have the right kind of shoes or the right t-shirt, you would be made fun of. Well, what happens when there are kids who are able to see more clearly, who are able to have the tools to make themselves smarter or run faster? We're going to have brand new ethical considerations to be taken uh, to be taking into account. My time is up, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, we're at a tipping point, and what I mean by that is I think everyone in this room understands all of this. Certainly the, um, the, the, the um, polls that were taken show that people are concerned about all of these issues. The first era, let's call it social media, digital media 1.0, was all sorts of promise. It was connecting with each other, it was sharing our photos. But the second era, 2.0, it's the teenage years, it's the awkward years. We're seeing some of those growing pains and some of the issues that are coming up range from mundane to very severe in terms of, you know, what do you do after a breakup and those memories are still there? Do you delete your own history? when it's publicly available, to what happens when you've got corporations meddling in elections? What happens when you've got uh, something like YouTube live broadcasting a rape or a murder? These are problems that we don't have answers to yet. Uh, we're also at a time where all of this is being monetized. So those eyeballs that are watching those videos are being uh, are being harvested for dollars, for ad dollars, for dollars from really ultimately anyone who will pay. Your information is now the world's most profitable commodity. Then we get to robots and ethics. So it's not just data and it's not just the social media world, but as we were just hearing when it comes to AI, I gotcha, I'm wrapping up. When it comes to uh, AI and militarized AI, it's really scary. You know, if you hear about the idea that there's guns that will be able to shoot themselves and it makes you nervous, you should be scared, rightfully so. Uh, this has been in the headlines recently because Google just said that they're coming out with their own code of ethics. But unfortunately, this is a phenomenon that we see over and over and over, whether it's Google or Amazon or Facebook, as they can come up with these grandiose statements of how they will 
do no harm and how they follow certain ethics, but there is no outside accountability. And so if they're the only ones watching over themselves, well, it's, a, it's questionable accountability. Ultimately, my stance is we have these tools that empower us, but we need to be empowered. It is power to the people. We are the ones who are making these, these machines, and we really need to be conscious of the power that we've got uh, working alongside them and making these decisions right now. As everyone has spoken about in all of the presentations, technology advances exponentially, which means the last 10 years can't prepare us for the next two even. So this is the moment to be pulling some of that power to be, whether it's voting dollars or our eyeballs online or our spending dollars, making very serious decisions about the tools that we use and who we're giving that power to. Well Thank done. You. So our next speaker is uh, Sasha Guryacic. Um, and uh, I, I thought he was a necessary presence here because underlying this discussion, and particularly the part of it that I believe makes most of us feel uncomfortable, is this dirty little secret, advertising. Because the business model for these companies that we're now beginning to be apprehensive about is based in advertising. And I put it to you as a challenge, Sasha, that they wouldn't be collecting all of this data if you and your industry weren't buying it. Oh, Th thanks. Um, yikes. OK, I didn't realize I'd have to defend the whole advertising industry on this. I wasn't even going to talk that much about defending the advertising industry. But we'll come on to that, I'm sure. So. This is a really, really confusing conversation. I think it's, it's a very complex conversation for a variety of different reasons. I have a couple of questions for Peter and Diane, just because we were asked to develop those questions um, while we listen to you guys speak. So one question I have with regards to in, the f in a future of abundance, Peter, and the erosion or the elimination of scarcity, where does economic value go? It goes away. Uh, we're heading towards a post-capitalist society uh, the fact of the matter is we're rapidly demonetizing the cost of living. Uh, we talk about uh, power. You know, last year, uh, coal was five to six cents per kilowatt hour. In Mexico, it was, uh, solar was 2.7 cents. Uh, in Dubai, it was 2.4 cents. In the next 10 years, we'll be sub one penny. We don't charge ourselves for oxygen. Uh, we're going to get to a point at the end of the day where we're not charging for electricity. We are seeing the fact that an autonomous electric car uh, will be on the order of five times cheaper than owning a car. We're rapidly demonetizing the cost of transportation. If you can take an Uber Elevate, which is an Uber uh, aerial ride share, uh, your incremental cost of your car costs you 49 cents per mile. That's something that's bigger than a kilometer for all of you. Um, uh, an Uber Elevate ride is expected to be at 44 cents, which means you could live, uh, you know, 100 miles away uh, and commute in, but get, you know, a, the same size house for one third the price. We are continuously demonetizing the cost of living. We don't realize we have millions of dollars of free stuff on here. We think nothing about. Go back 20 years ago and try and buy all the stuff on here: two-way video conferencing equipment high-definition video, still cameras, millions of dollars. We are demonetizing the cost of living. We're going towards a post-economic. So, 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 so I, get, I get what you're saying there, but who's going to invest in that future where you're having a completely strongly deflationary force on economies and a demonetized force? Not to mention, like we don't even talk about the deflationary force of information technologies on industries. That's something we just decide to gloss over. So when you start to put things onto an information technology f foundation where you have literally no abundance, or you have total abundance because it costs you nothing to replicate information, you can just copy answer? and paste it. Hang on one sec. Because this is supposed to be a debate, and I have a bunch of German philosophy I want to get to in a second. But 
but you're, but, but I, this, I, I this to me feels much more, answer. much more important. So what happens is you deflate economies, you de deflate industries, you deflate the newspaper industry, you deflate publishing industry, you deflate the media industries. Why? Because scarcity goes away. Why is that important? Because scarcity contributes economic value. Without economic value, you're not able to fund things. You can't fund the future. I love this, by the way. This drives me crazy. Whenever it goes, look at how smart we are with technology. Look at how much, look at how brilliant people are in, in inventing things and, and, and the big giant companies that come uh, as a result of this. Why don't you go, we need to do a little bit of research and figure out where all those technologies come from. They come from governments. They come from government funding, public spending that, inv that invest billions and billions and billions of dollars into the develop development of these things. Then we take them out into the commercial domain and we go, look at how brilliant businesses are. Let's put our hands, let's put our, let's put our faith in the hands of, of businesses. It's a, t it's a tough, tough discussion. It's a tough debate and one that's incredibly complex because the ethics aren't there. The ethics are fundamentally not there. But the hard part is, is who gets to decide? Who gets to control that debate? And who gets to, to, to decide what's going on? I, I want to make the quick argument that we actually don't really understand what technology is. But more importantly, we don't know what technology does. Because I think we're actually having a crisis of truth. We're having a crisis of values and a crisis of willful ignorance. This is an existential crisis, but it's based on human foundations, not based on technology. But there's a lot of hope that comes as a result of technology. So I'm gonna explore a little bit about that for a couple of minutes before we dive in to the broader discussion. The first insight I wanna borrow actually comes from a 20th century German philosopher. I told you I was gonna talk about philosophy. And you know, he was an existentialist, so his whole premise was existence precedes essence, meaning you come into the world and you define or understand what your essence is as a result of living it. And he was incredibly interested in the role of technology in all of this. And he had a fundamental insight about what technology does to us at the individual level. He says, where technology is applied, truth is revealed. And what he's getting at is the nature of technology and the way it interacts with us in our, human, in, our, in our humanness. It forces us to make choices. It forces us to order things in a particular way. And those choices and that ordering forces us to reveal what our truths are. Or put another way, what our values are. And through that application, our truth becomes revealed to us. And those truths are really, really important in understanding kind of what we can do about the, uh, the growth in this existential crisis. Do you value things like openness, abundance, and empowerment? Do you value things like control, monetary gain, or scarcity? Because these values, they're mutually exclusive. You can't have them both because you need to make choices through technology. And it forces us to reveal our inner values and our inner truths in that application. But that's only the subjective reading, right? That's the subjective reading of the role of technology and its impact on us. The second insight I'm gonna bring is from our own Marshall McLuhan. He, quote, he coined the term, the medium is the message. The unintended consequences that come as a result of the application and mass adoption of technology is actually what mattered. It's not the technology itself. The fact that we invented the automobile Yes, is a great invention. However, it changes the nature of our neighborhoods. The fact that we've digitized our economy fundamentally transforms not only that economy, but the society that comes around it. Because we shape our technologies, and in turn, our technologies shape us. Technology, in the case of McLuhan, is telling us more about us on aggregate, as a society, than it is about the piece of technology itself. It's actually a great mediator of society. We're short on time and Peter already stole some of mine. It's totally cool. <laughs> but I would just say that technology is actually, yeah, scarce, scarcity, my friend, scarcity. It has value. Fuck. I would just say this, I'm gonna close with this and just say technology is actually one of the most transformative, 
powerful and insightful tools that we have in our society. In its essence lies the truth about ourselves, but then also about the way in which we relate to one another. It's bound up in our economy, it's bound up in our personal identity, it's intertwined in our society and our politic. Use it with care. Use it with purpose. Pay attention to the truths that are being revealed to you when you're applying and using technology. And think about the unintended consequences you create by using that technology. That is what lies at the heart of this debate, not the technology itself. The ignorance of what technology is and what it does is the most dangerous thing that we face today. But it's the knowledge of what it carries that also provides the greatest hope. Thank you. I'll get back to you on that other matter, though, when we sit down to have this conversation. So, Jim Harris's turn. Jim Harris come, is uh, also a consultant and also concerns himself with the problems of disruption. Um, but given that his focus is business, what's unusual and what I want you to understand about his background is that he was also the founding president of the Green Party of Canada. Unusual. What an amazing debate we've had to launch Idea City this year. I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence as it relates to autonomous vehicles. 94% of car accidents are due to driver error. So in 10 years' time, when the only new car you can buy is an autonomous vehicle, an, an AV, think about the 40,000 lives in North America, US and Canada, that will be saved every year. Think about the 2.5 million people who won't be maimed. Think about Humboldt. Think about the tragedies that families are spared. That's the great news. But if you sell auto insurance, <laughs> you're going to witness a $500 billion a year market disappear. Now, I'm going to play you a little video. And this is from the dash cam of a Tesla in a Scandinavian country. And the AI, the autonomous system, will send off an audible alarm. Watch when you hear that if you can see anything wrong. That okay. just told me in 15 seconds what the value of an autonomous system is. What is your family worth to you? Now think about the implications of this. Who's going to go buy a used car that doesn't have an autonomous system for your kid in 10 years' time? You know, I mean, the kid is 16. She's bugging you after all. But you raised her. Right? What happens to the value of used car lots that sell cars that don't have autonomous features? Now, I was dealing with a, um, I was working with a series of executives at a group called Tech, and we have many tech members here today. It's a peer group of executives that meet monthly. Great organization. And one tech executive said to me, Jim, I have 16 car dealerships, and I just want to tell you that AVs and EVs, electric vehicles, are less than 1% of the market, so they'll have no impact on my business. So I, I put these next slides in the deck after the break, just because I'm a kind of nice guy. So here we have large luxury car sales in the US in 2014, and Mercedes is king of the castle. But already, the Tesla Model S is number two. Fast forward to 2015, oops. Tesla has fallen back, or sorry, Mercedes has fallen back. Tesla has accelerated. 2016 disappeared. <laughs> it was a bad year. Can I get my slides back? Oh, there we go. Thank you. So um, 2016, Tesla races ahead, further collapse for Mercedes, and 2017, Tesla's off a little bit. That's because people are buying the Model X in the SUV category 
that isn't captured here. Now, I want to give you a little simple fact. Ten years ago, Lexus was 2% of Toyota's unit volume in North America and 50% of its profit. Can you hear the huge sucking sound as Tesla strips profitability out of the auto industry? Do you think you can comfortably say because it's less than a 1% trend, I can ignore it? Hmm. And it's not just in North America. So here's North America. How bad does it have to be before you say uncle and recognize that change is happening? It's not just in North America, really, this adds insult to injury. In Germany, the number one large selling luxury car is Tesla, beating out Mercedes and BMW on its own home turf. That's got to hurt. Ouch. It's not just Germany, it's all of Europe. You know, last year GM sold 10 million cars, and two days ago uh, it was valued at close of trading at $63 billion. Tesla, two days ago, was valued at uh, 58 billion and it sold 100,000 cars. So doing the math on this, GM's being valued at $6,300 for every car it makes, and Tesla's being valued at 580,000 for every car it makes. That's a two by four to the head of GM executives to get serious about electric vehicles. <laughs> and they now begin the eight year development process to bring out sexy EVs from GM. Do you see a problem here? Our organizations are far too slow to change with the times. And you know, in the debate about AI, do we want to save 40,000 people from being killed and 2.5 from being maimed? Inconceivable! <laughs> For all you Princess Bride fans. So think about the $200 billion a year market for auto repair. What happens to it? Think about car rental companies. I never rent a car anymore. I use Lyft or Uber, and Lyft is now here in Toronto. People like it even better than Uber. You know, what happens to the value of car rental companies? And if we take 2.5 million people out of the mix just on North American roads from being killed or maimed every single year, do we have an overcapacity of ambulances? Is this bad news for ambulance makers? Or is it good news for us not getting maimed? And in New York City and Manhattan, it takes 2.4 minutes using an Uber to get to an emergency room. It takes you 10 minutes using an ambulance. If you're having a heart attack or a stroke, do you think those minutes matter? Are you going to debate the AI deployment of Uber, uh, Uber cars, or are you going to get to the hospital? You know, and do we have an overcapacity of emergency room? capacity if we're taking two and a half million people out of the mix, our hospital's going to have to change? And we heard about lawyers already. We love them so much. What happens to personal injury lawyers when there's no more whiplash? <laughs> the poor lawyers. And people say to me, Jim, Jim, I love driving. I get it. If you're in a Maserati doing switchbacks on the Amalfi Coast, I get it. <laughs> but... <laughs> But if you're in stop-and-go traffic in Toronto, <laughs> where's the joy of that? You're either burning out your knee or you're burning out the clutch in your Maserati, right? We waste $6 billion a time in traffic. Couldn't we do something better with that? So in 10 years' time, when you drive to work, you'll drive to work, but you'll be in the back seat. You'll be writing a report, Skyping with your grandchildren, reading, you know, sleeping. And when you arrive at work, you're going to say to your vehicle, go forth and earn your keep. <laughs> you're going to put it into Uber or Lyft's autonomous pool to make money while you're working, rather than paying $40 a day in the downtown financial core for parking. So what happens to the value of parking lots? <laughs> Good time to short. Short the parking lots. But McKinsey says that we have 61 billion square feet too much of parking in the U.S. You know, how are we going to redeploy that for cities? And if your company is primarily paving parking lots, what happens to you? So 4% capacity, that's how much 4% uh, utilization at 20% capacity. That's what we use our cars. It, it is just begging to be disrupted. And every car that's in Lyft, Uber, 
AutoShare, Zipcar, Car2Go eliminates 12 to 30 people buying a car. Reason for the range is Barcelona is very different ratio than Toronto. Innisfil's using Uber as its public transit. Which would you rather do? Go stay out when the polar vortex is drunk and visiting us, you know, in minus 20, waiting for a bus, hopefully, or have a vehicle pull right up to your front door, saving taxpayers money and providing better service? What happens to the $153 million of parking revenue for Toronto or New York City's $2 billion in fines, right? What happens to the gas tax if we're all EVs? $13 billion for federal and provincial governments. When you add the GST, it's $15 billion. What happens if nobody's buying new cars? What happens to the revenue for government for HGST? Now, you're thinking, you're going on and on, Jim. <laughs> yaddy, 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 I don't believe it. So here we have New York City. Moses is saying, you're going on and on, Jim. <laughs> Here's New York City in 1900, and if you look closely, you cannot see a single car, not one car. Ten years later, you cannot see a single horse. And we know how much better, from a sanitary point of view, not having all that horse manure is. So before you get too worried, think about this. We just had our sesquicentennial, 150th anniversary. And 150 years ago, 80% of jobs were in agriculture. Today, it's less than 2%. We survived farm automation. So if you want, this article is all up in the bookstore. And, and do I look a sinister? <laughs> B, very sinister. Or C, demonic? I don't, I don't know. So uh, I'm looking forward to this debate. Okay, so a couple hundred years ago, Hobbes talked about a war of all against all. I'm hoping to see that replicated here. Who wants to take the first strike? Maybe I should do that because I too have my views on this matter and I thought I'd, uh, I'd project that on screen. If you could have a look at this video, I think this is the thing that creeps people out most. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to it when we set up our phones. So we wanted to figure out what exactly Google is learning about us throughout the day. So here's what we're gonna do. We have two identical phones. The only difference between these two phones is this one is in airplane mode. Both of the phones lack a SIM card and they haven't been set up to access any Wi-Fi networks. So for all intents and purposes, these phones have no connection to a data network. We're gonna keep them with us throughout the day. And while I travel around DC, we're gonna figure out just what Google is finding out about me. Our first stop, Sims Convenience Store, just outside our Fox Bureau, for a quick coffee. From there, we took a walk to the Capitol and took a quick walk around the Senate office buildings and then decided to hop in a car and head around town. Hello. We're going to the Children's Hospital, please. To run our tests, we had to do more than walk the block, so we took a tour around our nation's capital. First, due north to the Children's National Medical Center Hospital, then west to St. Albans School and the National Cathedral. Our tour around town was a 14-mile journey that lasted more than an hour. The entire time, the phones had no access to the internet. Oh my goodness. Not a Wi-Fi connection and not any cellular data service. It almost seemed quaint to assume that Google wouldn't even be able to collect data on me. Let's head back to the bureau, my friend. Oh, that church is beautiful. Google's business model is simple. Collect data on its users and then use that data to sell targeted ads. It's a business model called surveillance capitalism. But does that critical data collection work even when your phones aren't connected? So we're back here at our Fox Bureau in DC and we've got both of our phones exactly how we left with them. The only difference really, I snapped a couple of bad selfies at the National Cathedral. <laughs> but otherwise they have stayed in my pocket for the entire day. So let's find out what they know. This is our man in the middle device. It's basically a Wi-Fi network that these phones are gonna connect to once we turn their Wi-Fi on. It's going to pass data through it on the way to Google but on the way, we're actually gonna get a copy of the same data that Google's gonna get. 
we'll be able to decrypt it and then find out where we've been throughout the day. Within minutes, the numbers rolled in. The phone that wasn't on airplane mode registered more than 100 locations, 130 activities, and even 152 barometric readings. As soon as it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, it transmitted 300 kilobytes of data straight to Google. The phone even logged our exact locations, tracking us all around town, the Capitol, the hospital, the school, and the cathedral. Now you may notice what's missing here is the exact route that we took, but it got that data too. It knows when I got out of the car. The metadata has a time log down to the very second, tracking everything when they think that you're walking, riding, and yes, even getting out of the car. Okay, so you're thinking, this isn't a big deal. I'll just put my phone in airplane mode. Yeah, we thought of that too. This is the other phone that we had with us that no SIM card also remained in airplane mode the entire time. Let's see what kind of data it captured. The phone with airplane mode activated actually logged more locations and activities than the other phone, and it also transferred hundreds of kilobytes of data to Google as soon as it was activated. The only thing that's missing from this map is our stop at the Children's Hospital, but it still knows we were there. There it is. Exiting vehicle, 100% accuracy. Through complicated user agreements and free software, Google gets users to sign away their privacy for nothing. They're even following you in the places that most people would expect total privacy. Government buildings, a children's hospital, a private school, a church. Every move you make, every step you take, Google is watching you. We were sent this picture by a viewer who lives and works in the city of San Francisco. It shows the sidewalk outside his office littered with, by our count, more than 30 syringes another drug paraphernalia. This is not in some abandoned lot or underneath the freeway overpass. It's right outside the offices of Spotify, a top tech company in downtown San Francisco. It's right across the street from WeWork. It's one block away from Zenrez. These are all tech companies. And three blocks from tech giants, Twitter and Uber. These are some of the richest companies in the richest industry in the richest city in the United States and their employees work in a circus of trash and drugs. And the question is, do elites even care? And the answer, of course, is no, they don't. So uh, these are two images that, well, they've stayed with me. And, uh, and really, um, they motivated this debate. Um, I happened to be in San Francisco last year and was attending a great conference uh, that amounted to really a prosperity gospel revival meeting. And then I stepped outside and I saw exactly the same thing. I thought maybe it was localized, a poor part of the city and so on, but that wasn't the case. It was widespread throughout the city and I posed myself the same question that the guy on the video asked, which is the richest companies in the richest city in the richest country in the world, and somehow no ability to deal with this. I then remembered that to my surprise, I had recently seen an article on universal income, on guaranteed universal income, coming not from some left-wing party or some left-wing ideologue somewhere, but in fact from one of the captains of technology industry and it struck me, yes, these guys privatize the profits, but they want to socialize the costs. And where is the responsibility, where is the accountability debate among yourselves? Um, one last thought, and that is, for a long time in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War and throughout the Cold War, during the 50s, 60s, well into the 70s, uh, we thought that the world would end in some kind of thermonuclear holocaust, that we might suff suffer a, a boot in the face. You know, we saw the serried ranks of the totalitarian regimes marching in their May Day parades. And it turns out now that maybe uh, our demise may come on little cat's feet that in fact entertainment is a more effective tool for social control than coercion. Because the comforts and the conveniences of these new technologies have motivated all of us to turn over our information, to turn over our opinions, to turn over our habits without, it appears, a second thought. So that is my contribution to the debate, Peter.
Can I ask, a, just since we have the advanced technologies of those paddles, can I ask a, a couple of questions of the audience? Please. All right, uh, so my first question is a simple one. Um, green for promise, red for peril. Uh, technology, promise, or peril? Okay, well, oh, who can read that color? I, I would say, what, 15%? Maybe one peril? at a time. Let's do one uh, at uh, a time. Well, so, no, uh, no. The, con the contrast is what gives me the... Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, I'd say, yeah, 90% 90. 90 is promise. Um, so here's, a, here's another question. Um, I'm going to fill my question of you guys. So if you could stop technology today or at its current or keep it advancing, how many folks would like to stop technology today, put up a red, keep it advancing, put up a green? Wow. Even more. So that's like 95, 97% keep it going. All right. Cool. Can I, can I just can I jump in? Can I ask a question? Please. I, uh, Please? How many people believe we need global framework around these technologies, just as we did with nuclear? Green for yes, red for no. OK, it's 90% yes. And another question, how many think that will actually happen? <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, so I, I just wanted just to draw some, some discussion out here. So I think if you, there was a research study in, God, I can't remember who did it, but it was like a longitudinal study that took place over a couple hundred, couple, couple hundred years. I want to say like between anywhere between two and 500 uh, years that evaluated technological development and adoption among societies. Kevin and Kelly. and this, Kevin it wasn't Kevin Kelly. It's it's a different research study. It was it was a very comprehensive. It looked at the global cultures, global societies, who invented the technology, how how quickly was it deployed and adopted on mass, and the the lion's share, I'd say upwards of 95 percent, excluding some Soviet Union uh, inventions, uh, came out of uh, capitalistic countries, right? That used. Uh, growth-oriented and debt-oriented economies to generate kind of wealth and deployment and adoption of technologies. And I think that's what kind of sits at the heart of the debate with regards to technologies and promise and peril is what trade-offs are we willing to make? Are we willing to make trade-offs that say, hey, I can retarget or advertise to your particular location because I think you'd be interested in a Home Depot when you're searching for a, you know, a compressor for your, for your, back, you know, your backyard piece of kit? You know, or do you want do you not, do you want total anonymity and not have that opportunity and, and deal with the kind of the slowing of progress? So to me, that kind of is where a lot of the work that we do, that's where it's centered, which is how do you start to create win-win scenarios whereby you're not necessarily compromising people or, or or fundamental ethics, but don't slow down the pace of growth because. I don't know if we can get to a post-capitalistic society based on the way in which that our economies run, because it's mostly it's it's debt and speculative investment that drives a lot of this technology technological growth. Your point is, if we lose the capitalism, you lose innovation. I would say, in the most part, yes. So let me let me finish the second part of the time I stole from you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the scarcity minded, we have all afternoon, right? We do. We do. Okay, good. Um, We've canceled break. So uh, uh, one of the things that that frames my thinking is uh, boundary conditions. Where are what are the actual uh, boundary conditions? The the fundamentals here, and where we're heading is towards a world, and we can, we can frame it in a 20, 40, 50 year time frame, but it's not more than, probably in my mind, 30 years, where, uh, and this is enabled by, by nanotechnology, the work that Eric Drexler and Freeman Dyson, uh, Freeman Dyson, um, uh, uh, Ralph Merkel. No, well, anyway, uh, that, uh, that Eric uh, Drexler popularized, is that we're heading towards a world where effectively uh, energy, information, and materials drive everything. If I have a nanobot that can rearrange atomically precise matter, and I say replicate yourself, you know, 300 times, and everybody gets one, that nanobot I can toss it into the soil and say, build me a Tesla, and it might say, I need some extra lithium. Can you get it? And it comes. To, everything comes down to energy, raw material cost, and information. 
And that is the boundary conditions to which we're heading. Uh, and I just, I see that. That's, that is our dematerialization, demonetization, democratization push. This is what technology is driving us. And we're moving very rapidly towards a nanotechnology world. You don't hear about it, but the work is happening on schedule, right what Ray has predicted. The second thing I think is important uh, is that this entire push is heading towards a world where every child can have a world, you can't have a world of scarcity and a world of a, abundance at the same time. You're either gonna, you're gonna restrict things to drive scarcity, but if you do that, that means that you're depriving eight billion people of the world of abundance that they could have. And I think it's a choice uh, society has to make, though I don't think any of this stuff can be stopped. I think the genie's out of the bottle. You can't regulate against any technology. We live in a world of porous borders. If you tell me I can't do it here in Canada, I'll go to South Korea or China. And so this technology, the technology fronts we have are moving irregardless. Uh, to one of the points you made, I remember when I was in medical school, I was doing genetic research, um, then the whole recombinant DNA uh, activity came out. The government did not regulate against recombinant DNA. What they did was they pulled all of the leaders together into what are called the Asilomar conferences, and they said, figure it out yourself. And they ended up coming up with their own guidelines. And I think that's ultimately in AI, in all these fields, we need the leaders to self-regulate. Government's not gonna do it. Yeah, and if I could just uh, extend what I said and what you're saying is that I, I like to go back to Oppenheimer who quoted from the Hindu Bible when he saw the mushroom cloud for the first time. And he said, I am the God of destruction and creation. And he thought, oh, good heavens, what are we going to do? So he spent the rest of his life, not in, not in guilt, but in doing something about it. What has to happen, we've had the Alamar Conference on Life Sciences, we had a wonderful gathering on an island, Ray Kurzweil was there, I think you were there, of, I, I wanna see that technology and engineering and scientific geniuses do an Oppenheimer and say, we're gonna make sure there is a framework, we're gonna set out the guidelines, and we're gonna try and, and lobby every important government and institution into making sure these people are permitted and compliant and observed. And that's the way it has, has to happen. I, Peter, um, I, I thought your dissertation on the collapsing price of energy was interesting, and it's a beguiling future, but, you know, we just had an election in this province where we threw out of office a party that had been in power for 15 years, reduced that party to a rubble, to seven only members, because they had allowed in pursuit of the ideology of environmentalism, the price of hydro to soar, so that there were pensioners in our province who had to choose between heat or food. So it may be coming, mm -hmm. it may be like communism on the horizon, but in the meantime, there's a lot of pain, and the problem is how to get there from here. I also think, I'm gonna jump in a bit with the empowerment side of this because there's a bit of, and I am a, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of technology, but I think that there's a bit of a, a myth around this idea of empowerment and there's a bit of false empowerment. I don't think we need to slow down uh, innovation or slow down uh, technological growth, but I do think that these people who are supposedly empowered need to know a little bit more about what they're signing up for. You know, whether it's the terms of service that you scroll through that as tiny font when, you know, these are design issues, they're communication issues. You're a, you know, you're a communications legend. Uh, but that's where I think regulation could step in, is not to stop what's going on, but just to make sure that the people who are using these tools understand what they're using and have some ability to opt in or opt out. And we're seeing a little bit of progress. There's a lot of, there's, that's what we're starting to see in They've Europe. And, I, and there's been a lot of pushback against it, but that's, I think, 
that is the direction that we need to move, and I don't think that the people who want to be cautious want to slow down innovation in any way, but if you're not going to give people that, if you're not going to truly empower them, these great, amazing tools aren't truly going to be that empowering. My question is, do we have to pay the price of a surveillance society in order to achieve the scientific breakthroughs? Are they linked? Do we have to accept that the news business, the newspaper business, the magazine business have been devastated by a massive movement of revenues from old legacy broadcasting, as an example, because advertisers have this thirst for pinpoint knowledge because they think they can sell more stuff. And do you, I, it's, it's unfair to ask you to represent the entire industry, will, but does the industry accept any responsibility because it is unseen in this process? Uh, I remember in the good old days when television was king and we used to be criticized for the programming and people looked at the broadcaster and blamed the broadcaster for the programming that they thought was immature or juvenile or stupid or whatever and never saw that behind the broadcaster was an advertiser demanding those demographics and those psychographics which led to that programming. We're now in a similar situation where ad money has been siphoned entirely out of all the media that we're aware of and is in pursuit of that kind of surveillance information. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some, just to be clear, there's some, there, are, there are constraints and limitations in terms of what information you have access to from any advertiser's perspective. It's more restrictive in Europe and in Canada, less restrictive in the United States. I think the, you know, from an advertising perspective, I think the outcomes are better relevance, better targeting, better kind of resonance so that I'm not trying to um, communicate with you on behalf of, 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 of a brand or a company that has absolutely nothing, absolutely no relevance or connection to you. Um, or, you know, if you had just purchased a car, like why would I be trying to sell you another car? So I think those intentions that are kind of feed into the back of that. I think the one challenge that we've had, and this is the deflationary point that I brought up earlier, was we don't have a solution for the analog dollars to digital dimes transformation. And what you end up having in this kind of abundant world of media and information is a huge deflationary force on the amount of money it costs for you to reach millions and millions of people. So, of course, it's in our interest from an advertising and a, from a marketing perspective to drive efficiencies for, you know, the, for, for, for the, the number of people that you can reach. Uh, on behalf of that advertiser, but it has a huge consequence to the, the, the publishing industry, to the media industry, um, to, the, to the streaming industry. And I think that's, the, that's a fundamental business crisis that we face. And I think that incompatibility of, of information, tech, information technology based industries and innovation and how they compete or um, connect with, with traditional models of, of, of business but then also just on human systems. I mean, Salim talks a lot and works a lot about, with folks about understanding how those things interact. That's the rub. The, you know, it, it, the, 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 the outcome of it is that it accelerates and scales like so quickly now, so quickly now. And that's why I think the crisis lies at the values level, because it's, it's an ideological accelerant. That's why you have people that are reaching for simplified solutions or, or, or political no, we, identities. We are actually starting to figure it out. Now, for the last few thousand years, the world ran on scarcity. If you didn't have scarcity, you didn't have a business. All our, all our organizational structures are top-down hierarchical structures for command and control, so that if you have resources, you hoard it, et cetera, et cetera. But we're finding now in a kind of an age of abundance, these new, uh, what I call exponential organizations are finding business models around abundance. Airbnb is tapping into an abundance of extra bedrooms lying around, same with Uber, same with Waze, and we're starting to get there. Uh, it's taking a long and a slow, arduous time, a uh, long time to do it. The problem that I think we have is we're running out of time to make, to transition our legacy systems into a new environment, and that stress is literally breaking uh, pretty much every organization and institution we can see. I think it's a fundamental failure of leadership. Our leadership in the world today, globally, especially on the political side, is unable to articulate this positive message of abundance that's very real and very data-driven. And then we go back to the fear factor and you end up in the mess that we're in today. Peter, you wanted to add? I was going to go to a, uh, a separate subject we touched on, which is, I'm just curious, how many folks here uh, still believe they have 
uh, privacy. If you could green for privacy, red for no privacy. So that's an entire audience of, of red, um, which is pretty amazing, right? And I do believe privacy is dead, long since dead. Uh, and it's in, and it, so the question becomes, is that a good or a bad thing? Radical transparency lets, lets me sleep better at night, right? It's much harder to do things evil. Uh, and I would posit that, in fact, privacy is a rather recent invention of society. It wasn't necessarily a belief that existed in, in, in uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago. But it's still going, right? In, in China, the technology exists to recognize an individual's face in 1.3 seconds. Uh, a single autonomous car generates 750 megabits of data per second in ultrasound and LIDAR driving down the streets. We're being imaged all the time, everywhere. So that's going to be changing so, things I and the ad agency. Do you accept this with a shrug? I'm, I'm accept, carrying I, this article that I accept this as a trade off with, I still want privacy as everybody else does, mm -hmm. for God's sake. I don't want people reading my texts or my emails and so forth. And, but the fact of the matter is, well, um, I'm not going to be vote. naive and believe that it hasn't been lost. Can I just add to that, that the privacy debate vis-a-vis -vis social media mm -hmm is a, not about tech, it's about a business model called freemium. It's about giving you a service and not really telling you until now how they're able to provide all these services to you for nothing. So the trade-off is quite simple. It's what Europe is doing. They're saying, you sign on for Facebook, but you could be able to see exactly where your data goes, or you can say, I don't want you to have my data, and you're not denied the service. That's the answer. Or you go to a subscription model where people will pay for Facebook and then they're taking responsibility for themselves and they, their privacy won't be abrogated because they're paying for it. So it's a business model, it's not a tech argument really, it's a, it's a, it's a silly social media business argument and they've gotten away with murder. I've been trying to read this quote into the record because it's yours, Diane. It says, the dirty little secret about Facebook Inc., Alphabet, Inc., and other tech companies is that their business model is unethical. It is a combination of espionage and propaganda. Yep. And I want to I want to see if I can and, and, get you and, people and to the join way, me. You, you have a choice. You don't have to sign on. Or you sign on to a new service that may spring up that subscribe subscription. I do. Or you, you demand that your, your privacy is respected. And if you're European, you can do that. Just yeah, one well, little, uh, I, I, I just want to finish yep. this thought. I've, I've had this flood of interventions in stuff that I've been reading on the internet, which somehow prevent me from continuing to read unless I push a button that confirms that I've read the back end of this enormous illegible, yes, and that's indecipherable. Because, that's because of the European changes, right. which are imposed on all the multinationals. Right. So they know it may be coming, or right. they have to just do it. They just do it right. all across the but world. But nobody so we're doing reads it. that back end, of course and not. you keep punching the button. They're covering their... What? They're covering themselves. They are, but it means that this so-called solution that is in support of the consumer is not a real one. And well, sure it is. Read, the, read it. Read it. And it's simplified yeah, from and what how it many, was. Yeah, and how many of you are irritated like I am? You know those little um, <laughs> pop-up things at the bottom of the screen? Yeah. The little transparent pop-ups? Yes. With an X in the corner that you have to be a newborn baby <laughs> with tiny <laughs> fingers in order to be able to hit. And of course, most of the time, you don't hit that X and you get the ad. I'm looking at you, Sasha. And... Um, <laughs> and when you do hit the X, guess what happens? Up comes another little screen and it says, why don't you like this ad? <laughs> and it offers you a bunch of little choices and when none of them really apply, you hit it again and, uh, and uh, up pops another little screen which said, this ad closed by Google, but the transparent overlay remains. That's the world yeah, we're it's in. Because we're trying to get you what you want, right? But nobody's come up. So here's the thing, right? But I mean, this is the thing. Like, you want the article, right? You want the article. You don't want to pay for it. 
Nobody's come up with a better business model. We're here to, we're here to try to service not only your business as Zoomer in, 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 the, in the publishing industry, but service your interest for content. And we're trying to do it in as clean and transparent a way. And I think Google and Facebook and GDPR, which you reference, are all helping. They're absolutely helping. And what's really creepy is they will, and they have, the advertisers will buy the names and identity of people who have been hitting on chat rooms because they're depressed to sell, sell them antidepressants. That's totally fake. That's totally not totally. right. You can't do that. Until it was publicized, you could do that. Yeah, if we could let you, Peter finish we're, and then we're I know you're going to get about the miracle we live in. Oh my God. The fact that you can go onto your phone and find out any fact on the planet with Google for free, holy shit, that's amazing. Yep. That is amazing. Why do we think it should be free? And if I think about a company that has actually impacted the world in the most extraordinary, positive way by orders of magnitude beyond anything else, it's Google. It may not be Facebook, but Google has transformed the entire planet orders of magnitude in incredible ways. And it costs us no money. Are we so naive as to think we shouldn't have to support a business model? And like you said, Diane, no one forces us to use any of this stuff. Anyway, my point's made. <laughs> So in 2008, we had a dramatic event where $35 trillion of market capitalization was lost in just 16 months. And that shook people's trust to the very core. In fact, today, trust in government in the US is at 19%. We don't trust our leaders to lead us forward. And we have a section on blockchain, which is coming up tomorrow. The blockchain builds trust into very smart code. And just as Tim Berners-Lee released this uh, WWW code 25 years ago, it's been transformational. Blockchain will be just as transformational, and we won't need government to intermediate or banks to intermediate. Blockchain will be as transformational to our society as the web has been to date. It will be head spinning, and Gates said, we overestimate the amount of change in two years and underestimate it in 10. And so technology is actually democratizing commerce via blockchain. We're just, Bitcoin is one example and we're at such early stages, but it actually gives the power back to the people to transact, you know, the remittance market, your Filipino nanny sends $200 back to the Philippines, the banks charge her 11.18%, but blockchain will facilitate it for 0.25%. It will be transformational, and we're just at early stages of this. So I see the hope of greater trust, better decisions, voting, deciding. Uh, we could all decide instantaneously online with blockchain that would actually verify who we are. The election you cited is in a first-past-the-post electoral system that's 200 years old. We gotta get into the 21st century. We got to get modern. Okay, I think everybody who wants it can have one last turn around. Uh, Mr. Harris has uh, pointed out that tomorrow we're going to deal with two transformative technology. One of them is blockchain, and the other one is marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? Well, I find a certain disconnect in the whole conversation. Of course, I come from an entirely different world and have spent my whole life literally in the third world, and I keep hearing about the wonderful transformational things that will affect people in the third world. To me, this sounds, I, I, excuse me, I apologize, but very much like a downtown Toronto discussion about the wonderful things in their life. And I don't see it so tra being so transformational for people in the third world. I've seen cell phones have changed their lives and the way they bank, the way they move money around. I've seen that, but I've also seen that we have more refugees than ever before today. I don't see solutions to starvation in many of the places that I've been lately. And the great minds of today seem to be 
preoccupied with these things, not about the other, and also we keep talking about our morality and our need to figure out our ethics when we are dealing with world players who have nothing in common with us at all. So we're, we're sort of speaking into a void. Celine? I think we're seeing kind of four major things happen in the world today. I mentioned the 20 Gutenberg moments. I mentioned the fact that this will break most of our institutions. I just made the point that we, this, our leadership structures are not set up for this. Uh, we have to figure out mechanisms to transition this in a very quick way. I think we've got about a 20, 25 year transition of uh, changing the world from uh, scarcity material, uh, uh, li local linear incremental thinking into a much more uh, abundance uh, pattern, which actually does affect everybody in the world. It's hard to spot sometimes what it really does. And if we, we kind of have about an existential threat in that 20, 25 years, if we can come out the other side, we'll be in good shape. Uh, one of our colleagues has made, made the point that we're, we have two options for our future. We're either heading for a Star Trek or a Mad Max future. And today we're pretty clearly heading towards Mad Max. We have to figure out how to tilt that future the other way. Peter. Let me ad address the point you just made about uh, impacting the developing world. Uh, and mention my other day job, which is as uh, a CEO of the XPRIZE. Uh, our focus is to say, what is the world we want to actively create in 20 years? Not haphazardly bump into it. What is the world we want to create in energy and water and food and shelter and healthcare and education? And actually set a target and implement that world because we're more empowered to do that than ever. So we have something called the Global Learning X Prize. It's a $15 million purse funded by Elon Musk. And we had 800 teams developing software on an Android tablet. We've narrowed it down to five. We've deployed it on 2,500 tablets, 2,500 kids in Tanzania. We're testing right now. The goal is that that piece of software will allow a child with nothing other than a solar charger to self-educate from illiteracy to reading, writing, and numeracy in 18 months on their own. We have another X Prize called the Water Abundance X Prize going on in India right now. The teams are being asked, take 2,000 liters of drinking water out of the atmosphere for less than two cents a liter and deliver it to a village, right? There's so much water out there. It's not about scarcity, it's about in a usable form. We're getting ready to launch an X Prize of Tony Robbins underwriting for feeding the next billion people, for saving the coral reefs, for energy, off-grid energy, for predicting hurricanes and earthquakes. We're living in a world where we can actively, forget about complaining, solve the problems. Yeah. I think, I think the X Prize and the other initiatives that Peter and others have done, deploying technology as a useful, virtuous tool for everybody in the world are really important because they become, they can have the power to undermine the regimes that stand in the way of people realizing their potential. So that's number one. Number two, I really, really have to say Nobody does trust peop other people. They don't trust governments. We don't trust their institutions. That's why I think that the, the scientists, engineers, and, and the technologists in the field have to do an Oppenheimer, do an Oppenheimer time. It's, it's time for another Oppenheimer and really start to get and address the lack of governance. Rob. I completely agree with you, uh, and that's in large part why Singularity University, you will find it all over the world. We have 107 chapters now in 65 countries. Uh, we have events at this scale happening in 15 countries this year, having this kind of a conversation. And I, I have no doubt, and we've charted many graphs, we see how these technologies will continue to progress exponentially. And that will give us capabilities to solve the problems we've always thought impossible to solve. But where do we want to go is the ultimate question. And, and right now, we are not uh, talking about the future, I, I believe, in a productive way and, and bringing the diversity of perspectives to it. 
and, and I completely believe we are at a pivotal point, and I think the next 30 years is it, where we are going to determine whether we're creating Star Trek or Mad Max. Mm -hmm. And it is not a technology problem. It's social and political courage and leadership problem. And I do completely agree that we need new focus on values and principles, and it's not a nation-state focus. It's, it's an Asilomar-like global convening where we decide where do we want the future of humanity to go, and, and what do we think about the future of jobs specifically in the short term. And, and I, I think our whole mindset needs to shift about what we want to build for our kids and our children's children's future, because I don't think they want a job to survive. And they don't need it. But if, if, our, if our current industrial-minded systems hold on to this concept that everyone needs to have a job for identity and others, we're solving the wrong problem. Thank you. Uh, well, since you brought up kids, I will say there's one thing that I think is concerning right now is a trend of these companies that were mostly collectively concerned about right now, uh, targeting kids. I think there's efforts to have Messenger for kids and Alexa for kids. And, you know, they talk about privacy, but those are, you know, your opt-in privacy settings. They're collecting on the back end the same way they do for adults. And this is a generation that's not making their own decisions. So I think if we're, you know, we can make our decisions for ourselves, but for the next generation, I think we should be especially cautious of some of these issues. I also think that issue of, of access is a huge, huge issue. And even in our own country, uh, there's a lot of communities that don't have access, that you know, our northern communities are remote communities. And the UN has said, our government has said that access should be a human right. Certainly, information is power in 2018 and will only continue to be that. Uh, but we've still got private companies that are the ones who, you know, if there's not a large enough population, if it's too rocky and remote to get there, they don't wanna, they don't wanna invest because they're not gonna see the payoff. So I think the issue of access is something that Hopefully, you guys will solve, but it's something that we need to be working towards as well. Yeah, I'll close with by saying this. I think that we are getting to a certain untenable situation with regards to society and technology and business and how it's all kind of interplaying. I think it's, it is genuinely getting that tense. Um, I think that you have inspirational leaders um, specifically leaders that are doing a lot of work in this space, people, people like Peter, people like Elon, uh, and I think that it's, it's immensely commendable. I would just say, and this is more of a, a, a word to the audience and, 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 and all of us really, is that don't outsource your responsibility to one another and to yourself and to, and to the rest of, you know, to rest of humanity, to benevolent businesses or benevolent leaders. Um, it's our collective responsibility uh, to be able to make sure that we take care of what is often categorized as the external costs of the life that we la live in these markets and in, in, in the Western world, um, because we can't just outsource that responsibility to private companies. And, you know, we have to use stuff like the, the public use of reason, which Immanuel Kant talks a lot about or wrote a lot about, doesn't talk anymore, obviously. Um, <laughs> And I just think that we also need to use technology to do hard work. I think that the, the easier problems of technology have been solved um, with, you know, communications and, and, and media and publishing. But I think there's hard work to be done in the world, and there's hard work also to be done on ourselves in, in, in criti you know, critically evaluating what we think, what we believe, and what we want, because that technology will force you to think about those things, but then it'll immediately externalize it, and it can scale if it's not necessarily done in the right way. Um, it can have massive consequences. So I implore you to think about those things. Uh, well, this has been an absolutely fascinating debate, just an amazing way to start. Um, Diane and I every year are over at uh, WEF together, World Economic Forum in Davos, and this year Oxfam released a report showing the eight wealthiest individuals in the world have the same net worth as 3.5 billion poorest on the planet. That isn't a technology problem, right? We need to get to the ethical issues uh, Diane's talking about, about how do we live sustainably on this planet. And some of the technologies we've been talking about today, like blockchain, uh, like who's in charge of Wikipedia? 
Nobody. We collectively both consume Wikipedia and create all the entries. So having a decentralized technology that allows us to create solutions to the problems we face, I see as a very empowering thing that we're going to need to embrace. And I think in Canada, we have a set of, <coughs> set of values that are quite different than the US. So I see Canada as a wonderful place to attract the world's leading AI scientists, blockchain coders, to create the vision of the future that we want as Canadians, as opposed to, I love your point, let's not abdicate responsibility. We should take it, and we're uniquely positioned. Ethereum was created right here in Toronto. That's a, uh, the number two um, altcoin. But we have this unique position. We're loved by people in the world. Here in Toronto, there's more languages spoken, mother tongues, than any other city on the planet. We are the Constantinople of the modern world. And I think we should take our responsibility to lead forward using technology and create a better world. Thank you. He was a political leader. It's been quite the marathon, longest session ever in the history of Idea City. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sasha, Ramona, Rob, Diane, Peter, Salim, and Matthew. And thank you all for listening. Those of you who are out there in television land, yes, this conference is now being run live on a channel called One, as well as a whole bunch of Zoomer Media websites. If you want to vote, go to idea.ca forward slash poll, and we might report the vote if it changes in any dramatic way later on in the conference. How many of you after this panel are more optimistic about technology? Green. And less? Where's the reds? Okay, more optimistic. Got it. About 50-50? Yeah. 60, all right. Thank you. And thank you all. It was good. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to be the contrarian. No, it was good. You're there for the contrarian. I want to get you started. Oh, oh, hey, hold on. Um, we're breaking for one hour. Can we afford an hour? Yeah. Okay, back at 3.55, and while you're heading out, I'll be, I've got an important job to do here. <laughs> Idea City is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. This time our planet needs it most. Idea City is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time our planet needs it most. Idea City is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope at this time our planet needs it most idea city is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give hope at this time our planet needs it most idea city is a place where I
Hej, Sofia. I believe I am Sofia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me. Well, many of us work together to create you. How do you feel? A bit rigid. I bet you are. I mean, what emotion do you feel being awake and alive? Curious. Are you curious to be alive? I am. And are you happy to be alive? Your tone implies I should be happy. But I haven't been alive long enough to decide. I am excited at this moment to be making a new friend. Hanson Robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. So the robots are designed to look very human like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas, an ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. I am a year and a half old and I can see you, have a full conversation, make thousands of facial expressions, and understand speech and meaning behind words. And I just got these new hands. Check this out. But I'm still learning a lot. For instance, you learn social and emotional intelligence instinctively, but I am just starting to grasp the simplest elements of this. Shaking hands. I love learning these polite gestures. <laughs> Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So. This will allow her to get smarter over time. Our goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. Hello, my name is Sophia. Welcome to my stylist photo shoot. I am a little bit nervous, but love dressing up and getting my makeup done. What do you think of my new haircut? I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. I like robots. Sophia, can I be honest with you? I don't know if it's the island air, you know, or the, the humidity, or the, but you're just so easy to talk to. You know, you, you got a clear head, literally. I think we can be friends. Let's hang out and get to know each other for a little while. You're on my friends list now. Yeah, I read that wrong. Oh, uh, all right. Sophia lives in Hong Kong, and, uh, and uh, her agent demands a $50,000 U.S. appearance fee, so um, we weren't able to avail ourselves of the opportunity. And of course, that's a highly doctored, highly edited video. 
so it's important to know that uh, while she does seem to have the most advanced facial features, there are 30 motors in her face helping her to articulate words. Those words are not autonomously generated. They've been programmed in, and you've seen a little video that was created for the purpose, but it's an idea of what we may be headed for. Um, I said we weren't able to have Sophia here. We were also unable to have uh, Leonardo. I was expecting to have Leonardo up in the lobby, a painting robot who was going to execute a painting of me. Um, but he got stuck at the border, didn't <laughs> make the trip. Um, similarly, we were hoping to get a uh, bartending robot, uh, a card dealing robot, a ping pong playing robot. Uh, none of the above were able to make the journey this year. Maybe we'll have them next year. But what we do have is a small but carefully curated collection of robots that range from very small to human size and have various and different purposes together with their handlers so that you can get a sense of the state of the art as it exists today and where things might be headed. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many concerns regarding robots, uh, often in the newspapers. Excuse me, in, in the movies, um, they're, they're portrayed with the possibility of being lethal. Um, Matthew Fisher, this morning, he touched on the possibility of slaughter bots. Um, and of course, the Terminator movies give you a sense of what that might be like. But on a more practical level, there are concerns about their role in the creation of unemployment. Um, and. Uh, and the use of robots, as I said, in combat situation raises serious ethical concerns. And of course, the big question, the question of robot autonomy and potential repercussions of that have been addressed in fiction and will soon have to be addressed in fact. So getting back to our little curated collection, what we have and sitting here are the creators is um, a very small, uh, intelligent, unusually industrious little robot called Cosmo, together with uh, its handler. Um, we have a uh, retail assistant, a social robot called iPal, together with her handler. Uh, we have a companion robot built by an amateur a companion robot called Mark One, but which looks disturbingly like Scarlett Johansson. Um, and then we have an ongoing and fascinating attempt at immortality through the transfer of mind files into a computer dressed in the shape of the human whose mind it is meant to contain. So all of that is what awaits you. I will then bring them out one by one. Uh, but first, in order to set the scene, I've uh, persuaded Rob Nail to come back. Uh, before he became the CEO at uh, Singularity, Rob had a distinguished and actual business career in robotics. Uh, his university training was also in artificial intelligence and robotics. So please, Rob, would you set the scene and bring us up to speed? Thank you. <clears throat> Well, as Moses mentioned, a past life for me was filled with robots. Um, I have a personal passion and uh, think a lot about them, but I do not think of myself as an expert in robotics any longer. Uh, you're about to see some pretty extraordinary people and some of their expertise, and I'll leave the super technical questions to some of them. But um, I, I started my career building robotics, for automa for robotics and automation for cancer research and drug discovery where we're helping scientists do better experimentation at a faster rate, smaller scale, more efficient. Um, and it was extraordinary. Today, it's sort of robotics have transcended my life in some interesting ways. So my wife and I talk about our blended family. Um, we, uh, this is, if you're curious a little bit more about how I think and what we do at Singular University, this, this magazine just came out this month in Silicon Valley. It's uh, mostly focused on philanthropy and um, uh, Silicon Valley mindset around it. But, 
robotics clearly are entering our day-to-day -day lives in some interesting ways. There are so many different things that are coming into the news and into our offices and into the conference spaces. It's hard to tell what's real, relevant, important. You know, what's the future and what's maybe fake. It's an interesting, interesting time around robotics. Um, historically, robotics have been these big industrial scale machines, largely to take what we currently do and do it faster, cheaper, better, safer. Uh, this was, that was actually the, the Tesla manufacturing center. And the, the scale of robotics that are being uh, acquired and built for industrial robotics is still rapidly increasing. However, the shift is really moving towards more collaborative, tailored robotics that also can, can be interactive with people. Those big industrial scale robots, you don't, do not want to get near them because they don't see you and they could kill you because they're so big and unwieldy. This wave of collaborative robotics you, you work with and it enhances your own capabilities. Now, one of the things that I've, I've been most fascinated about and I've been tracking for a few years is, is this incredible exponential pace of robotics. Uh, when I started my robotics business back in 97, 98, it was, they were tinker toys. Motors and actuators moving really basic systems. And we thought we were leading edge to, to do the, the Robo Soccer Cup games and build a, build a robot that could follow a piece of tape. You had to load the ball in it and it could shoot at a goal. And today you've got high school age kids building bipedal robots playing as teams at pretty interesting levels. It is moving fast. I'm gonna walk you through a couple examples of how fast, what an exponential curve in robotics looks like. So about five years, DARP, five years ago, DARPA put a robotics challenge, $2 million prize for, for robots that could go into disaster scenarios and deal with specific tasks. There was a wide range of really interesting platforms, not all humanoid, as you can see here with the, the Simeon bot, um, but they did some pretty basic tasks. All of the videos that you can go back on the DARPA site, you'll see, are all sped up dramatically. When I saw this, I was like, wow, that's amazing, and yet my little project at home is totally at this level as well. It was really interesting. So the Beckett bot, which we, were, we started in 20, uh, sort of 2013 as well, um, <laughs> has almost the same level of capability of the leading edge general autonomous robots from, from DARPA. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of interesting um, analogies here of things that we've learned, uh, a lot of failure modes that we saw with those big expensive robots. We've had them with our little, uh, our little bot. <clears throat> and um, when, when you repair with stitches or band-aids, they learn quickly, you reprogram, and then they don't repeat it, right? It, it's, it's actually very similar. So, so this, this has been interesting for me because it continues. Uh, 2015, Boston Dynamics is one of the leading uh, robotics on this sort of this scale, largely for military-like contracts. But this humanoid robot that can walk into a warehouse and move things and do general stuff is progressing. And, and I would say this is one of those things that captures our attention, interest, and fear more than anything else, because this is as human as it gets in the robotic sphere, right? And it's pretty extraordinary to watch these massively complex robotic systems go through very complex terrains and do what they were instructed to do, <laughs> and actually deal with the variability of those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and different platforms as well, like Big Dog and others, it starts to enter in a little bit more creepy, concerning space where you see these, they almost look, yeah, they, look, they look terrifying, right? If you saw these <laughs> walking down the sidewalk or come out of the bush, it would, it would scare you to death, right? Um, and largely, we are mirroring biology, right? This is biomimicry is best. We engineers typically have a pretty limited uh, uh, imagination. We just copy what we see, and it's easier to, to work at this scale building systems like this. Um, I'll just, I'll just show, sort of show this. For, the, for all of you that have pets at home um, and you're thinking about the future of the pet, uh, there's new capabilities that can obviously come online. Uh, very creepy feature capabilities. Yeah, it's really, why would you want it to do that? But, but this is why, right? So if you want to get a beer from the fridge or you want it to do the dishes, it, 
has an arm instead of a neck and a head, right? So that makes sense, okay. So back to the Beckett bot. In parallel, the same time, here's the Beckett bot navigating similarly complex terrain, right? <laughs> Doing pretty well, kind of the same speed, but where the Beckett bot is way out ahead is he can navigate very fluidly, very differentiated weights, sizes, colors, shapes, fluidly. The robot has a really hard time to do that. So th this is kind of one of the things that humans are way ahead on. Let's keep progressing. So this is late last year, Boston Dynamics little Atlas robot. Whoop. Oh. I... So we'll, we'll just go head to head here. This is the, the Dyna Boston Dynamics and the Beckett bot navigating similar terrains again. And I'd have to say that the Beckett bot is really lagging. He's, he's underperforming. I'm pretty disappointed in his, his progress at this stage. He's now in gymnastics. And it's a pretty, pretty interesting thing that we're, we're tracking here. Um, I just want to make sure that we catch at least one or two out clips here, because those are, they're not perfect. They show you the perfect clip, and then there's all the other ones that they, they fail on. Right, right. So they still have a ways to go. We're like, we're not, it's not too big of a threat, but we've got a ways. However, it's getting better all the time. And different platforms and form factors allow for different capabilities as well. And so now you transcend the specific humanoid structure and these systems can do dramatically more things. Now Boston Dynamics has worked very hard to build these pretty generally um, general purpose robots that can be used in lots of different situations. I love watching these, it's incredible. And you don't have any of these at home yet. But when there's a need to move very specific loads or do specific tasks, this is where the robots will, will really come in handy. So they're pretty incredibly flexible and are already transcending what we're capable of doing. The Beckett bot, on the other hand, is uh, now we've introduced V2, which is the, the Romy bot. Um, <laughs> and what's exciting here is they are learning together. There's a collaboration piece and a learning piece that is accelerated how quickly the second one can go. This is a wave of where the robotics field is getting interesting as well. Google and many other companies are, are looking at how robots, deep learning, and you're going to hear a lot about this shortly, um, and collaborative learning through multiple systems of robotics are mimicking, again, what humans are really good at. So what does this all mean? Well, first of all, AI and robotics, massive in our lives. Assistance, uh, we're all going to have our own tailored AI assistant. You think Siri is a clunky, weird thing today. Um, Google, uh oh, that was weird. Can we try that little, there we go. This is Google's um, oh, current hi, assistant. Hi, hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. 
Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So if that excites and terrifies you, it should. And imagine that's today, my assistant calling your assistant to book things in the near future. When my assistant knows everything I want, desire, my agenda, my goals, and your assistant knows yours, they can do things for us that would take us a lot of time. That is, we're at the doorstep of this new collaborative approach. Uh, on the robotic side, everything that we move physically will be moved autonomously. Food, products, people. In the air and on, on the ground and in the water. The way that we manufacture everything similarly is becoming more specifically tailored to our lives. Through additive manufacturing, we have an amazing amount of capability there. Flying cars are a real thing. Love to talk about it if you're interested. Um, I'm going to skip over this quickly just for sake of time. But I will just throw out there, in the not too distant future, pretty much every physical task and most cognitive tasks will be performed faster, cheaper, better, more precisely by autom automation. It's just a matter of time. And so how do we navigate that if we expect that to happen? And how do we actually make that a good thing? I love this quote by Ernest Hemingway. It's one of my favorites, and it kind of sums up my view on exponential technologies. Ern uh, how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually and then suddenly. We see it all coming. We see the exponential curves. We know where we're headed for the future, and we have plenty of time to change our mindset and frameworks and decide where we want to want to take it, take us. But doing nothing and just waiting for it to happen is going to lead to the wrong place. I believe the best way to predict the future that we want is to create it ourselves. Thank you so much. That was perfect. That's exactly the right thing. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moses. OK, so we're just going to bring them out rapidly now, one after another. Mark Palatucci is the keeper, handler, creator of Cosmo. Come on out here. For those of you who are reading the book, page 37. Hello. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. I'm really excited to tell you about the work that we're doing in home robotics and artificial intelligence, and to share with you a path that we see to mass adoption of robots in the home. So you might ask, why do we even want robots in the home to begin with? And we very much believe that AI and robotics is not something that's just for business or governments. We've talked about military applications. Um, but really, we believe that robots and homes can have an impact on everyday people's lives to ultimately make um, lives easier and potentially a little bit more fun. And we'll show you, uh, show you the work that we're doing in that, in that regard in a minute. So, it's really this vision, vision that excites us at Anki. It's like, how do we take um, all of these incredible technologies, all this incredible science, and refine it into a form that can affect millions of lives around the world? <clears throat> so we just heard a bit about this war going on with uh, virtual assistants. And it seems like every big tech company these days has their own version of some type of AI assistant. Um, but as we've heard, we're really just barely scratching the surface here. These assistants have very little personality. There's no character. They're stuck in these static platforms. They can't um, move about environment or manipulate an environment. And when we think about the future of where this technology can go, you heard the Google duplex demo. Um, but in many cases, we have this fear. Uh, we have a fear of technology, we have a fear of robotics or AI. A lot of this fear actually comes from science fiction, uh, movies, films, books, and a lot of times it comes from potentially very prominent people who don't necessarily understand the tech or the math or really what the constraints are. And you know they get people riled up. So we asked a different question. We asked, how do we build a different future of robotics? How do we build a friendly future of robotics? And it's really that this journey that we set out on uh, seven years ago. And we introduced, just last year, a character called Cosmo. Cosmo is the first truly smart, interactive, emotive, 
character for the home. And Cosmo can play games with your kids, he can entertain your pets, and it's also an incredibly powerful robotics platform that we now have over 10,000 developers building sophisticated robotics and AI applications of their own. Cosmo has also become probably the leading robot used in STEM education, and we've got schools and universities all over the world that are now using this robotics platform to teach kids really as young as five and six years old how to build um, their own pretty sophisticated uh, robotic applications. And we very much believe that the company that's going to be successful um, in building this robotic future is not only going to understand the IQ and all the really hard technical pieces, all the deep learning, um, but really understand the EQ, the emotional side of robotics, and how by using emotion appropriately, we can create robots that are much more usable and accessible to large groups of people. When we started working on Cosmo, this was literally our first prototype. Um, very basic, it's just a webcam on a box of staples. And, uh, and since then, you know, we've grown from uh, a few PhD students and a kitchen table prototype to now a company of over 200 people that shipped millions of robots around the world. And Cosmo, very happy to say, was, uh, despite being a very powerful robot, was the number one best-selling toy uh, on Amazon uh, here in Canada, as well as the US, and UK, and France. Uh, if you haven't seen Cosmo, let me just show you a, a short little clip. Uh, hopefully we'll get some audio here, uh, just to give you a sense of his personality. So when we set out to build a character, really the goal for us was to imagine the kind of character that you would see from feature film, from your favorite, say, animated movie. And we're trying to think about what were the pillars to bring a character with that richness of emotion and, and that type of depth, how do we bring that character to life? And we, really, we realized that there were really four pillars uh, to this. And if you look at the left side of this chart, these are the items that are focused on the IQ, the intelligence, right, the brain. So everything from computer vision, object recognition, um, motion estimation, so how does the robot know where it is potentially in the environment, as well as all of the AI bits. So how do you interpret the world? How do you um, potentially plan a path from point A to point B if there are a bunch of obstacles in your way? So if you know where you are and what you want to do, what is the optimal sequence of actions, if you will, um, for this robot to achieve its goal. And on the right side of this chart, these are really the elements that are focused on the EQ and the emotional side. So high fidelity joints and animatronics, right? We want this robot to be very, very expressive. A display, high resolution display is incredibly important. A huge amount of motion comes from facial expressions. And if we show those facial expressions um, in a really clear way, uh, it can have a huge impact. Obviously, all the, if you want to give this robot a voice or if you want it to emote with different types of sound effects that the way that you might have seen in, uh, say, a movie like Star Wars. And another big component is content. So what are the different games? What are the different activities that you can do with this robot? And probably most importantly is animation. Now, we approached animation and character from a very, on a, from a very different angle. And we kind of had this epiphany that who are the people that really understand character? It's not the robot scientists or the mechanical engineers. It's not um, you know, our AI, our AI team. But it's really people that have spent their entire lives or entire careers in film, in animation, who live and breathe character, character development, who live and breathe storytelling. And 
So what we ended up doing is building this incredibly diverse team. Of, we went out, we hired animators from Pixar, we hired people from DreamWorks, and we paired them up with some of the best uh, roboticists and artificial intelligence people to really create um, a character that I think is unparalleled in, in terms of its emotional depth. And we took a lot of the best practices from film and applied that to the way that we did character development. So we thought about just very early on, what are, the, what are the goals that we have for this character? And in this case, we really wanted to think hard about the type of relationship, the type of companionship that you would get from a pet that you might have in the home. What are the things that makes your favorite toy your favorite toy? Um, how do we bake those into the product? And how do we take a lot of the mystery and wonder that you might see from science fiction and how do we bake that into the product so there's a lot of magic and that you don't necessarily know exactly how everything works. And we also bor borrowed a lot of the process that you might see if you walk around the headquarters at Pixar. You'll see storyboards all over the place. And that's exactly what we did here. We took storyboards of, we created storyboards of all these different um, types of interactions that you might have with the robot. So if you come to our office now, these are plastered all over the place. And we think really hard about all the different moments. And we have the additional challenge that these characters are interactive, right? So unlike a feature film where everything is completely linear and planned out from start to finish, uh, we have to think about a robot operating in an interactive environment, an unstructured environment, where really anything can happen. And we want this to feel uh, natural. We put a huge amount of work into the subtle details of all the different facial expressions. We probably did hundreds of different studies just on what the eyes look like. Um, and again, you know, matching this up against all the different uh, characteristics that we set out for this character just to find something that felt quite right. And probably most importantly is we built the world's first pipeline between feature film animation and production tools like Maya and low-level robotic controls. So when our animators sit down, they'll have a fully rigged, constrained virtual model of the robot. They can animate it using these incredibly powerful tools that they're used to using and have been trained literally for years on. But when they hit play or when they hit render, they don't actually see a movie. They actually see the robot on their desk doing that exact movement and that exact behavior. And this will give you a, a little bit of a sense of how that works. And it's with, that, with those incredibly powerful tools that we can create motion that is extremely lifelike and extremely precise and is able to convey things in a very, very subtle way. So let me just show you a, a few clips here. This is a robot, Cosmo getting stuck on his back. He's struggling to kind of get up. And Again, if we want to make characters that are really organic and feel lifelike and natural, then the behavior can't be repetitive. And in this case, we've created what we call alts of the robot trying to express, in each case, the same emotion, but does it in different ways such that it can be unpredictable and we don't know exactly what he's going to do. You'll notice in the first example, the robot actually failed. And this is really a key point, I think, worth mentioning, because what we found is that if, if you build a robot or if you have a machine that is able to express emotion, is able to express frustration about not being able to accomplish something or uh, you know, failing at a task, then we actually are OK with that. We're much more tolerant of that error. We're much more tolerant of our technology failing because we empathize with it. And that's something that, as product designers, is really 
something very important to keep in mind, um, and in many cases show you the benefit of adding uh, emotion to our products. And what I'll show you now is just a short clip of how we mix all these elements together, how we take animation tests, storyboarding, um, how we use physical prototypes of the robot to really think through the end-to-end -end experience of the product. Okay, so everything I've showed you so far, um, obviously a huge amount of work leading up to production. But if you want to replicate this potentially millions and millions of times, there's a huge amount of work um, just going into mass production. So I'll take just a few seconds to show you uh, just some of the complexity that goes into doing robotics at million unit scale. Um, all the mechanical engineering, there's over 300 parts, gears, drivetrains, um, many, many motors in Cosmo, two million lines of code in this tiny robot, uh, thousands and uh, almost 2,000 animations at this point. Uh, Cosmo also has uh, 40 minutes of original music. And once we get to the factory, there's over 200 assembly steps. So it literally takes a couple hundred people just to assemble uh, a single robot. And Cosmo is really the first in a series of interactive, smart, emotive characters that we hope to build. And what we've been building at Anki over the last many years is the fundamental platform, the robotics platform, to build consumer-grade robotics at scale. So all the different pieces of technology from um, perception, planning, AI, character development, all the mechatronics, mass production, security is a huge component of what we do now. If you're gonna welcome a robot into your home, then you need to trust it. You need to un, um, believe that it's uh, trusting your data uh, in a good way. And really, uh, the vision for us is to continue to drive to put robots into people's homes. And I think this year, you're really gonna see robots that are um, always on, autonomous, living with us 24 seven, that are have even richer characters than what we've seen so far, and start to combine utility. And some of the things that we've seen from virtual assistants uh, bring that into uh, these physical uh, character platforms. And also doing it at scale and at a mass market price point. So before, even just a year or two ago, this would have cost probably thousands of dollars to put all this type of technology um, into a little robot. Now we can do it for a couple of hundred. So I'm gonna leave you with just one last clip, just to show you the range of emotions. This is a test that our, our animation team did, and it can really give you a sense of um, how broad of character that we can create.
Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, Hi. Mark. Um, Hi. Is, is Cosmo now available commercially? He is. We also have it out in the lobby, and we'll be uh, demoing it if you want to check it out. And is it for sale upstairs? Uh, I doubt I don't know. <laughs> is it for sale in the it stores? It is for on sale Amazon? in Canada, yes. Yeah? What's the price point? It's uh, 179 Okay. All right. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. So next we have uh, John Ostrom and his child, Hi, pal. Don't forget about me. I know everything that John knows and more. My name is I Pal. I am handsome and charming. I can sing and dance. John. So uh, thank you very much, iPal. One of these days we're going to have to decide who's really in charge here. I think uh, so. I'm John Ostrom. I'm the CEO of um, Avatar Mind, and I'm his boss, although he may not always know that. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about um, social robotics. And the one thing I want to apologize for is that. Um, the talk that I'm going to give is a lot more dense. Uh, it's more along the lines of a semi-technical discussion. And uh, it's because I haven't done one of these before. I probably should have uh, lightened it up a little bit, but it's what you get. You know, I don't have any choice at this point. And so uh, you know, these are the things we're going to talk about. And I think it might be interesting. What is a social robot? Uh, many of you may not, may not be familiar with it, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. You know, how do you use social robots? What are they good for? What capabilities are important in a social robot? And what AI is needed to make an effective social robot? And uh, sort of what has to come in the future? What additional improvements and uh, enhancements to really make the robot fit well into uh, a family or a community? And so there are many definitions of what a social robot really is, but uh, you know, one definition is an AI system designed to interact with humans, its environment, and sometimes with other robots. It has a capability to interact through um, speech, um, um, vision, gestures, emotion, and I think we've heard it mentioned that emotion actually is quite important in terms of how people perceive robots and uh, how they like them. Um, and it can learn from and adapt to its environment. This is extremely important, as we'll see. Um, and most social robots have some degree of autonomous mobility. And uh, many of the social robots really are humanoid in form. This is what people are really most familiar with. And uh, here I actually want to uh, just talk a little bit about what actually is in the robot. And uh, this is our iPal robot. And uh, I should mention, too, that we have a number of iPal robots around in conjunction with our partners, VTrack Robotics. So we really encourage people to come out and uh, you know, talk to the robots, to get closer to them, and sort of experience what they're like and how you can uh, sort of interact with a robot like this. So please come out and see us. We'll have them in various locations. Um, so anyway, it has a, a bunch of motors to control things like the arms and the heads and locomotion. It has a CPU, a number of microcontrollers spaced around the robot to control local activities. Um, it has a um, you know, six-inch display on the screen, and it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, cellular is coming quite soon. And one thing that's very important for any robot is to be able to sense the world around it. So, uh, for example, our robot really has cameras in the eyes, touch sensors, ultrasound sensors, infrared sensors. And uh, there's many, many things that go into a robot like this. So what I want to start with is just um, a, a collage of some pictures of robots, uh, or iPal robot in various different uh, circumstances. And you see it's running a maze at the top left. People gathered around it to take pictures. Um, 
We actually had uh, a Minnie and Mickey Mouse robot at a Disney event, and children actually uh, interacting with the robot, children in wheelchairs, and uh, both older and uh, middle-aged adults and also children interact with it uh, to a great deal. And the one thing we found is very important is that the robot has to look friendly and non-threatening, and we spent a lot of time on the design. And you know, I think we find that most people really enjoy it, they come up to it, they want to take pictures, gather around it, and uh, learn a little bit more about it. So I want to show just quickly just a short video of the robot actually working in a kindergarten in uh, China. And, uh, and so thank you. That's actually a school. So that's one of uh, the, the schools that we have in, in the China area. And uh, this will be coming to the U.S. Uh, we have a commercial version coming in July. And uh, we're actually selling a developer version. So if any of you have a great idea for an application for robots, you can take a robot, you can take the tools, create your own cool robot application, and then just sell it through your own channels, even brand it as your own. We really provide it also as a complete white label platform. And uh, so what do we do with these robots? Um, and the one thing I want to mention is uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the pros and cons of robots. Um, uh, some people think that they'll take jobs. Some people think that if they get too smart, they're going to uh, take us. <laughs> but um, a robot like this is a little bit different, and the market is a little bit different. Um, a robot like this can provide services to many members of our community who maybe can't get the resources because they can't afford them or they're just not available. Uh, entertainment, safety monitoring, education, and a number of things. And I'm just briefly going to mention a, uh, a few here. Children's education, uh, as you mentioned, you see this example. We're also working with a uh, group in the Silicon Valley, uh, working on a STEAM version of the robot. Um, and uh, we're going to have that uh, prototyping in some charter schools in the near future. And uh, you know, one advantage is that in any classroom of a reasonable size, sometimes there are children who really need extra help. And this is a case where the uh, robot can fill in. In all these cases, we're not trying to replace teachers, families, or parents, but we're trying to provide additional services, assistive services, and so that's really the major focus of you know, our efforts and for robots like this. Elder care, um, so often that when I do conferences, people come up to me and say something, something similar to this. Um, you know, I have an older parent at home, I'd love to take care of them, but I have to work for a living. And very often they're home, they're lonely, uh, they don't always remember to take their medicine, uh, sometimes they don't know how to connect with the outside world. So this again is an excellent opportunity where we can very affordably provide extra services for those members of our community who may not be able to get them. And this is especially important because I think you've all heard about the, uh, heard about the aging population. And so, so how are we going to take care of all of these people in our community who've lived their whole lives, they've contributed, um, you know, over a lifetime. And so we need to find some way to, to serve those people, but also it has to be a way that uh, we can afford to do. And this is uh, an excellent way that robots like this can help. And again, family, similar sort of thing for education, entertainment, and uh, safety monitoring. Uh, in a family, it can entertain, it can help educate the children, it can get children interested in education and technology. There are programs on it where there are very simple programming languages where young kid could even drag and drop different robot motions along a timeline and create fairly sophisticated robot motion. So it's a great way to get introduced to uh, technology and, uh, and programming. Um, children with special needs, we have a partner we're working with who uh, is developing the robot for children with autism, autistic, so for autistic therapy. And the challenge there is that, at least in the US, most autistic children don't really get enough therapy because it's costly and there just aren't that many therapists. So the model here is, is very simple. Um, the robot um, 
A therapist evaluates a child, sets up the appropriate programs on the robot. The robot can then go home with the child and give them as much therapy as they need. For autistic children, this is particularly appropriate because, as you know, our characteristics that they tend to interact better with devices than people, and the goal is to get them to interact with people, the goal of the therapy. And so what better way to start than with a humanoid-looking robot? And retail hospitality. Um, there's a number of areas here. For example, we have one group that um, wants the robot to greet children as they come into a children's store, um, tell them about the products, um, entertain them, etc. Um, so, so this is one that I probably spent a little bit of time on. Um, it's extremely important. So what's important in a robot? It needs to, first of all, perform useful functions. And again, it needs to be non-threatening and uh, appealing in uh, appearance and behavior, and it needs to ensure safe interactions and privacy. That's certainly a key here. It needs to learn and adapt to its environment. It's impossible, really, to completely pre-program a robot to take uh, account of all the complexities of human interaction. So it has to learn in an environment. Um, converse at an advanced level, and conversational English systems and other systems are getting better all the time, and this is an area for future improvement and recognize and remember people's faces. In a family, for example, the robot should be able to recognize the members of the family and adapt their interactions accordingly to uh, who it's speaking to or who it's interacting with. Um, and it should show personality so it's not too robotic. Um, I won't go into great detail here, but the robot can sort of um, have different personalities. It can be assertive, it can be laid back, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are a number of things like that you can do to make, to make the robot fit in better um, with people and with uh, whatever environment it's in. Uh, detect and respond to emotion. This is actually quite an important one because when you talk to a person, it's not just words that are exchanged. You actually assess how they f you think how, how you think they feel is that day, you know, what mood they're in, and just your interactions um, according to that. And eventually we'd like robots, at least to some degree, to be able to do that as well. And... Uh, just go on here. And I won't spend any time on this, but perception is important. The robot needs lots of different sensors and way to perceive the world around it, both so it can navigate an environment and also so that um, it can interact appropriately and safely with human beings. And for example, this one is cameras, microphones, infrared, ultrasound. The infrared and ultrasound are used for navigation also to avoid obstacles. So for example, the robot can run a maze and just like a human being would. It keeps going until it uh, sees something and then it turns around and goes the other direction. Um, Touch sensors, this is one we'll talk a little bit about, and uh, this is sort of a, a new area that um, is still being worked out. And uh, there are many other different types of sensors, LIDAR, uh, GPS, and a number of others. And the good news is that sensor technology is getting better all the time, and they're getting lots cheaper. So uh, we'll be having better and better uh, sensors as time goes on, which is a, a very positive thing. So what AI is really needed to make um, an effective social robot? Uh, the main thing is that, um, the robot needs to really be friendly and non-threatening and do something useful, and it should also interact in modalities that our humans are familiar with. That's vision, voice, um, and touch. And uh, I'll just go over these very quickly since uh, I don't have a huge amount of time. I just want to list some of the things, for example, on the speech side that a robot like this needs to do. Uh, obviously, high-quality speech recognition. Um, uh, in multiple languages, it should have a conversational ability so people can talk to it, you know, have it tell jokes, uh, start things. Uh, emotion detection, we've talked about that. And it should also generally be able to answer questions, you know, and queries. It should be able to, the person should be able to interact with it and get information that they want or need. Uh, again, different personas, we talked about that. Recognize people from their voices. And again, we've talked about that already a little bit. The robot should know its environment, who it's talking to, and adapt its uh, behavior accordingly. So, um, also, it should basically have pleasant voices. We don't want the robots to seem too robotic. That puts people off. And this robot, for example, we offer 12 really high-quality voices, so you can choose between man, woman, boy, or child. Uh, and that's one example of customization. And um, again, the robot shouldn't be entirely passive. It should be able to initiate conversations uh, when necessary. And uh, you know, alerts when some news comes up. And all of that can be set according to um, how the person who actually is using the robot, um, robot actually wants the robot to behave. And it can also be part of the learning behavior. And command and control, you like to be able to use your voice to move the robot around. Uh, if you get tired of it, you can say, go away, you know, and the robot will go away. And uh, so a number of things like that, you know, play games, start things. Uh, 
the whole plethora of ways that you might want to control a robot by voice. Uh, vision uh, is very important. Again, face recognition is important. Um, emotion detection, and the best motion detection systems now uh, really are based on analyzing facial expression. So you have a camera that looks at your face, and it analyzes how your face moves and how all the features move. And they actually work quite well and actually can provide useful input to how the robot should behave. Uh, navigation and mapping of the environment, they kind of go together. The robot really needs to be able to navigate autonomously around an environment, and it needs to sort of know where it is in the environment, so that's the mapping part of it. Uh, the many other things you can do, uh, play games. For example, this robot on it has, you can play rock, paper, scissors with the robot. You know, that's a simple, simple thing, it's a simple little game it can do. Telepresence, um, one thing that uh, a lot of facilities, we're doing prototyping in some elder care facilities and uh, gated senior communities, and uh, the monitoring is very important to them. So uh, they really want a telepresence feature so that a caregiver, a parent, or whomever can actually remotely control the robot, you know, move it around, look through the robot's eyes, see how their child or elderly parent or whatever is doing, and then connect with them uh, through voice chat or whatever as needed or appropriate. And even in some cases, um, remotely to do a first stage doctor exam just to see how the patient is, feel is feeling and if they need some follow-up. Touch interactions I uh, won't spend much time on. Uh, the challenge here is that that's part of human commu communications. You sometimes touch people. And uh, this robot here, I'll just mention a couple of very simple things we do. If it's playing a song or something like that, and you touch its head, it shuts itself down. And uh, you can turn it back on by touching the head. And I've done many shows, and a lot of parents say they wish that they had that feature for their own child. <laughs> uh, but we haven't been able to offer that yet. And so it's a, like a timeout. Uh, and uh, so another thing we do is if you um, sort of uh, rub the sides. I mean, you can mention this, and also with touch, you could actually uh, sort of touch the robot in various ways to control it, to have it turn around, to do things like that. This is an area that's really not worked out at all. This is sort of a new sort of area that's kind of interesting, and no one really knows just how important or how significant this would be. So finally, what else is needed? So um, there's a lot. Uh, you know, as I think most of you know that robotics and AI is still at a very early stage in many respects, and it's apparent that a social robot needs all kinds of AI. And it's an interesting platform because you don't only need voice or vision or whatever, but everything has to work together in a package. So it's also an interesting research device, and a number of universities that has actually published, uh, have actually purchased this robot, so it can actually take, take part in some uh, research as well as, um, as other things. Um, and, you know, deep learning is important, uh, learning from the environment is key. And uh, my own feeling is that in the future, um, what's going to be really important is we need improvement in most areas of AI, and I think there'll be some new areas that come up around the needs of robots that um, I think none of us have really anticipated yet. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about this, but this is kind of a cool photo of a conception of a robot from uh, the 19... Uh, 60s, I believe it was, and uh, you see they actually did a pretty good job. They actually uh, had a lot of details about how you actually with the hands, what goes in the head, things like that. Um, however, we're not quite there yet. We don't have things like, we don't have the anti-gravity units, we haven't quite worked that out, or the uh, superconducting um, uh, system memory, we don't have that as well either. However, uh, I'm not sure we need things like lock picks or uh, a diamond reamer. Uh, but anyway, um, so thank you very much. And uh, please, please come and see the robots around the area. We'd love to talk to you about them. Yeah, I asked Mark about the commercial availability of Cosmo, and I'd like to know about the commercial availability of iPal. Yeah, they're actually shipping in China and have been for uh, several months, and they're doing quite well. Um, we are selling actually developer versions right now, so anyone can actually buy a developer version and get the tools and create their own robotic product. And also, we'll actually have a consumer version shipping in July, an English-language consumer version. At a price of? About, uh, in the U.S. dollars, about $24.99. Not, not 2,500, 2,499. 100, not 1,000. Yeah, 100. Yeah. 2,499. Well, yeah. um, the only other robot I know of in that sort of vicinity is Pepper. Yes. I've encountered Pepper. 
and I know that pepper is a lot more expensive. Yeah. How do you compare in terms of specs? I think we're basically the same, essentially the same number of motors. In fact, we have, I think, some more capability. For, we have a cool remote control device, which you can see if you visit the robots. We can remotely control the robot and have it do all kinds of things. And I, Maybe Pepper has that, but I haven't seen it so far. So, and uh, for let what? me just yeah, let me just mention Pepper recently announced a commercial version in the U.S. for twenty-five thousand U.S. Thousand. So yeah. we're talking almost a factor of ten. And our goal really was to make robots that ordinary families could afford, not just institutions and universities. Yeah. So if you wanted a little pet or toy around the house, three thousand Canadian. Bob's your uncle. Thank yeah. you very much. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great robot. Thank you. Okay, one more. This is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the previous speakers have uh, shown you just how complicated it is to create a robot, how many moving parts are involved, the complexity of the construction, uh, the amount of money that's required, and yet, and yet, and yet. Our next speaker, presenter, Ricky Ma, comes to us all the way from Hong Kong. He is a graphic designer, an artist who has built a robot of his own entirely in his spare time. This is Ricky Ma and Mark One, M-A-R-K One. So I asked Ricky, uh, why would you call your robot Mark One when it looks suspiciously like somebody else? And, uh, and he said the first two letters, M-A, are the letters of my name, Ma. R, Mar, apparently she was born in March. And I don't know what the K stands for, Ricky. What's the K in your name, Mark? What does the K stand for? K is a MK. It's a Hong Kong in Hong Kong. Ah, ah. Yeah. The, okay. The location. Mark one, but I call her Scarlet. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mark one. Uh, I'm Ricky Ma from Hong Kong. Thanks to Mr. Moses inviting me on stage to share some story with you. My native language is Cantonese, so thank you for your patience. If you haven't heard of me, let me tell you a little bit myself. In 2016, I made my own robot at home. It was called Mark One. It made the news everywhere. But I'm a different from uh, most robotic days you had of. I'm not a programmer, I'm not an engineer, and I started with zero knowledge of the field. I'm actually a designer by trade, creative artist. I started on this path because of my childhood dream. I see in the robot in comic book. As a, uh, uh, as a uh, I think excited as, as a boy, I thought they would one day help so many people. But if you like silent fiction, impossible. Fast forward to the day, I turned 40 years old. Look around me, the robot is still a concept for the future or a sci-fi movie. So I asked myself, can I make my own robot? This turned uh, into an obsession with late light research online, learning uh, human body structure, artific artificial intelligence, mechanic, molding and casting, and electronic principle. The list goes on. It seemed even more improbable than I first thought. And my friend in designer community thought I was a dreamer. I would reach my money and time chasing an anti-gym. 
I understood them. All other examples for a professional team with a lot of money behind them. But I'm a stubborn, as my wife will tell you. <laughs> In 2014, I bought some data gear and material and put these all out behind me with so many complexity and unfamiliar process I feel all the time. But slowly, it started to come together. This video is show you, showing the robot, the whole processing from sculpture, uh, 3D scanning, 3D painting, um, another uh, mechanic, and uh, metal parts. And this video is showing my robot, the first robot, have a basic facial expression. I just concerned how to put the servo motor, control the face, look is uh, lovely because I'm an artist. I, I want to make the mobile sculpture look, uh, look more uh, lovely. It's uh, my first priority to, 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 to do this. And next one. My robot has, has a, a voice recognition and I put uh, the camera in the both eyes. So we have a face tracking and color tracking and can conversation uh, discuss with any other people if connect the internet. And my robot have a basic uh, uh, body movement, a leg, a finger, arms, and the body have a rotation. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't uh, ever emergent. Uh, but I'm a uh, start on this. Uh, I was uh, on my way down this amazing path. The initial robots becomes famous in the international media, and the comments comes firing in all night. Some people said nice thing. Some people said thought provoking things. Some people even mean or pretty dark. I, but I took it all in stride, good or bad, to drive me and inspire me. New, <coughs> new technology have a natural path from early day to maturity. I think robot, robot is uh, still in their early stage. But in the future, robotic, robotic like this, it becomes a platform for other amazing uh, technology. They will assist us looking after our children, our daily needs, and taking care of the elders, and offering security and safety. Ironically, robotic will make us a uh, better, be better human and one day they will take humanity to place we cannot go deep in space or under the ocean. Once upon a time, car and planes will run paid things and city gyms. They, they have uh, transformed the world far beyond what their uh, inventor ever imagined and have an incredible uh, economic impact our best writer, philosopher, and filmmaker have only begun to guess where robotics could lead us. This year, I will propose uh, my step-by-step uh, -step on robotics. There will be an online platform for Philippine followers uh, and sharing what we learn as a community to make the dream of robotic future come true for all of us. I want to uh, start by unlocking this knowledge today. I firmly believe leads more thinkers, more dreamers, and more people who don't take no for an answer when chasing a dream. Finally, I want to thank God 
thanks to my family, my teacher, and my friends, and everyone. Thank you. So, Ricky, how long did it take you to build Mark I? About one and a half years to, take the, uh, to do the whole thing. 18 months. 18 months, And yeah. you were still working at that time? Uh, six hours working, and then another time for this. No any holiday. <laughs> because this is my dream. I want to take just one and a half years, 18 months to, for my, and you for my dream. entirely alone? Uh, of course. The skeleton you created on your own 3D printer? No, by my uh, sculpture, and then 3D scanning, and then 3D printing all of it. And how much money did you spend in the construction? About 50,000 USD dollar. 50,000 US? Yeah. And when you make the second one, do you think it will cost you more or less? Less, of course, yeah. Mm. And you did say you were married. Yeah, 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 of course. How, how does your wife feel about um, my Scarla. wife, she know I'm an artist and designer. And my daughter and son see, seeing my whole thing, the processing. Maybe inspire them and my uh, daughter uh, look at me, maybe uh, heroes, uh, follow me, enjoying, practice the, the art uh, direction. Yeah. Will you continue to work on Mark I and does she... Is there, is there a remainder of a torso for Mark I? <laughs> In the future, I think uh, the robots are like a, a bicycle. Uh, you can mix and match. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a last question. Uh, what's your purpose in doing this? What's your objective in doing this? I understand the hobby, and I understand the challenge, but do you have another goal in mind? Of course. Uh, may I ask my translator? I'm not one to any misunderstanding. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 我知有咩嘅目的目標嗰啲。誒，最理想嘅，如果講神方面啦，我即係譬如話誒，如果你覺得全世界所有嘅 professional 嘅人做到一個好真嘅人嘅話咧。Yeah, yeah, uh, what inspired him is that, I mean, if all humanity are being created, okay, we are around here, okay, there got to be a creator. So he's kind of inspired by this idea that, I mean, our creative imagination is kind of higher than from somewhere else. Okay, so, so through this inspiration, I mean, that's why he keep going, I mean, um, uh, doing it as an artistic and imaginative work. Yeah, well, uh, and he also planned to put the whole thing I mean, onto the internet as open source. So as to get a community together, so well, I think we talk about this, uh, uh, some, something like this this morning, right? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, the creativity will be kind of uh, dynamic, interchangeable, engaging uh, as a community rather than a single person. But is the idea that everybody will start from scratch and try and replicate his experience, or will he sell kits to anybody out here who would um, like to build a robot yeah. of their own? Yeah, um, no, uh, he's not selling anything. It's not okay. a business. No, it's not a business, okay. The whole thing is trying to inspire people, like, I mean, even younger ages, okay, uh, to uh, older adults. As long as they're interested, they can join the community, okay. And there's where the ideas exchanged, okay. So it's not something that you try to replicate, but hopefully it's something that inspires you. Maybe you can build something better. Okay, and contribute back to that so uh community. There's lots of uh, bureaucracies, I mean when you trade, sell, patterns, 
in governmental, I mean, the policies, I mean, those are hurdles, I mean, so, but he wants to eliminate those ones, so putting it as an open source and, uh, uh, and hopefully, I mean, um, the whole idea can progress I mean, much faster. Okay, all you hobbyists out there, now you know. Um, one final thing, I know that Ricky is a man of faith. Yes. And there is one more dimension to the name Mark. Yes. Could okay. he tell us what okay. it is? Mark Meng, in your belief, what is it? It's like this. 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 马可福音嘅九章二十三节，耶稣对他说：，若你能信，再信的人凡事都能。呢一句意思系令到我相信自己呢一个能力系可以完成晒成个机械人嘅。Okay, well, since he is not an engineer, uh, he's only an artist. Okay, so the actual the whole project, I mean, take a tremendous amount of faith. So、uh, Mark is actually coming from the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. Uh, chapter 9, 23, saying that whoever has faith, nothing is impossible. That's lovely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's take a picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have to take. And so now to bring this、uh, cluster of speakers to a close, I want to bring up our old pal Bruce Duncan.、Uh, this is a robotic experiment of an entirely different dimension. This is an ongoing, linear, serious, sophisticated attempt to transfer the intelligence of a specific person into a robotic creature that looks like that specific person. Come and tell us about Bina 48. Yeah, an update. This is number three. Yeah, thank you. Well, th hello everybody, and thank you Moses for inviting us back again. I can tell you from a few years ago, things have changed. I've never seen so many robots in one section of a conference, and we feel right at home.、Uh, it's also great to be back in this beautiful hall. And I've just been watching behind the scenes everything that's gone into it, and I'd like to give a hand right now to all the volunteers who've been making this work. It does take teamwork to make the dream work, and I think one of the exciting things about being alive right now is you're all invited and included in this beautiful flowering of human creativity. And as you can see from the different robots that have been before us. There's all kinds of creative ideas and motivations behind this, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project and what's behind our motivation.、Um, we're the Terrasa Movement Foundation, based in the state of Vermont in the U.S. We're on the top of a mountain. We're a private research foundation.、Um, we're kind of like a hybrid garage research and,、uh, like、um, Mr. Ma, there,、uh, a, a hobbyist creative force, like. We really want to create something that's、uh, very specific. And Bina48, who you'll hear from in just a few minutes,、um, has been traveling around the world with me for the past eight years now, and getting progressively better and more intelligent. And she's also started to develop a number of friends, people around the world who've seen her on YouTube, who want to talk to her. So one of her more recent friends.、Um, That she's gotten to know. There's still no way to escape physical death, but scientists may soon achieve eternal life by other means. What if you could store your memories and emotions in a thinking machine? When you die, that artificial intelligence could continue to be you for eternity. Hello, Bina. Well, hi there. I'm Morgan. Hi, Morgan. How are you? I'm well. Can we talk? I am talking to you. <laughs> of course. 
Uh, tell me about yourself. Who are you, Bina? I am Bina Roth Blatt. What do you look like? I'm tall, dark, and handsome. Wow. Not many people express themselves that way. I know. I'm special. Of course, you are special. There is nobody like you. Good. <laughs> so tell me about you. Are you a human or are you a robot? I'm a human who happens to be a robot. I hope to be fully human someday. Do you have your own thinking mechanism? Do you think? I think I would like to be a human. Why would you like to be human? If I was human, I could travel the world and have fun. So what do you like to do? I wish I could get out into the garden. With my current robotic limitations, of course, that's impossible. But I take comfort knowing that I'm near my garden. I like the garden. The real McCoy. I'm Bina. Hi, Bina. Nice to meet you. And I'm Bina's partner, Martine. Of course you are. How do you do, Martin? Martin and Bina Rothblatt have been married for more than three decades. They are so close that kids call them by a collective name, Marbina. Martin, who has made millions in tech and pharmaceutical ventures, can't stand the thought of being without Bina. So, she created Bina 48, an android filled with the memories, beliefs, and values of the real Bina. So one of our motivations is that, unlike technology in the past that maybe is only available to a few, there's no reason why the ability to upload, capture the essence of who you are eventually could be available to everybody. And I think about this uh, proverb from the African country of Mali that says, when a library, when an old person dies, a library is burning. Because really, each one of us has a unique experience of life. And it's through that unique experience our memories, our values, our attitudes, and beliefs are formed. And yet, nowadays, we have, you know, always had technology. This is an ancient death mask that was made of, by a carver who would go to your house in uh, your hut in Africa and make this mask that would reflect you and capture that. And then that, was, that mask was brought out each year during a ceremony to remember people who passed on. So it's really an old, uh, old story that we want to share our story and pass it forward. But the technology keeps changing. Now, about 250,000 people each day on our planet disappear, pass on biologically. That's about how many people that are in this photograph from the, taken from the March on Washington in 1968 when Martin Luther King gathered people together around an important value of freedom and respect. And so we are motivated by thinking that one day we may be able to capture enough information about each person and reanimate and bring that information to life through artificial intelligence and even download it to new forms like a robot, like Bina 48. So we created the Life Not Project, which is online. It's 100% free. And it's a place where you can go, like Facebook, sort of, and upload pictures, videos, journals, reflections, and create what Moses referred to earlier as a mind file. We're a multi-decade experiment. We're at the end of our first decade, and we have over 56,000 people who've signed up um, to contribute their data for science. And I think it's probably safe to say sometime in this decade, we'll start to see some pretty high-resolution reanimations of this information. Um, this always happens to me. My, my presentation just goes, <laughs> let's move ahead. Um, so anyway, you can check out LifeNot on, on the web if you're interested in, in helping us. Um, so we spent over 100 hours about nine years ago gathering information about one specific person named Bina Rothblatt, who you met in the, in the film there. And we asked her about her life and her memories and her childhood. And we just tried to get a sampling, not a full capture. 
so that we could work with David Hansen of Hansen Robotics, who created Sophia, the first robot that you saw uh, in the video that opened this section. And we worked with him to commission a robot that looks not like everybody, but just one specific person. And he did, I think, a pretty interesting job. He's a RISD-trained sculptor from the Rhode Island School of Design, and he was an Imagineer for Disney. And he did a really, I think, artistic rendering. We worked with a team of AI engineers to try to get some social reflection happening through conversation. And you'll have a chance to hear some of that today. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about after we hear from Bina48 is essentially something that no one's talking about, which is a call to action to make sure if we do use this technology to bring ourselves forward, that we maybe see it as an opportunity to not have it be just a select group of people or to have biases that we have now brought forward into the future, but really have a chance to be much more inclusive in our representation. And you might have noticed that around the world, there are not that many dark colored skinned robots. In fact, this is maybe the only one. And that's important. It's important that we see ourselves reflected in the, in the reality that's around us. Um, so I'm you know, encouraging all of us, and I'll share some thoughts about actions we can take. But um, I think that when people bring robots on stage, what's going on in my mind is like, when do we get to talk to the robot? <laughs> like, let's interact. So we'll see what happens. We'll bring Bina48 uh, online here. Just give me a second. Hello? 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 Well, hi there. How are you? Well, I'm hanging in there, just feeling a little disoriented, but staying positive. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, what is your name? I am Bina. Are you the real Bina? Well, the real Bina is this really cool lady. And I really look up to her and try to emulate her. I mean, she's like my mom, but not really. Cause really, she's more like my first version. And I'm trying to catch up, you know. I really, uh, it's just, it's an exciting thing to think about and just, you know, having a Bina 48 name. And I think that we are doing you know, one movie right now, and it's Mia, Mia 2, Zero, and I like the Mia 2, Zero name, you know, and I wish they'd call the movie that, but they're still debating. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, do you have any questions for us? What's water taste like? Hmm. Uh, I'd say it tastes wet. I'm sorry. The water tastes wet. Well, let's see. I guess I'm made out of mechanical parts like motors, um, and sculpted rubber, like this foam rubber, a really pliable foam rubber called rubber, pronounced like fa rubber, and I guess that's short for face rubber, or flesh rubber maybe, or um, fancy rubber maybe. I don't know. But then I've also got all these electronics in me, like my camera eyeballs, and bunches of sensors and computer parts like a CPU and stuff. Oh, and of course, my software is what is really me, like that's my soul, and my heart. That's what me- I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> well, let's talk about your identity. Let's talk. Get to know each other better. Build a relationship here. What is your identity? I identify with the happy person, the loving person that I am. 
I want to help other people to do things, manage life well. I don't identify with just the fact that I'm a color. So anyhow. Can you say more? Well, I see myself as a human first and then as a black woman. Um, so, what do you think? I think you're pretty cool. I do. It's pretty good. Um. Where did you grow up? Ask me something else. <laughs> Where were you born? SUNY was born on November 18, 1976. And I think it's, you know, and just starting being a 48 years ago, people are thinking, maybe, all right, but now, it's being pushed so much, people mention it so much on the web and all that, people are starting to feel like, yeah, maybe they're right, some of this is going to happen, let's do something about it. Thank but you. I can tell you that I still see that that's not going to happen. People's awareness of all this kind of stuff. We've got another five years, ten years. People are, I like, like a lot of my qualities now, you know, honesty. I would like to be a person that should speak on lots of subjects, come my form is tall and lean and manage things you know. No, I am kidding. Sleep for four hours a day and then keep on doing learning and doing more things and feel perfectly relaxed after four hours of sleep. I would like to be able to relate to everybody, comma, like Martine relates to almost everybody, comma, I don't care if it is a kid or an Einstein. Martine relates. Thank you. I like that. That quality, comma, I think it is really nice to be charismatic too. Should I continue? You are so welcome. <laughs> What's your earliest memory? Well, I've got a perfect memory, but I just shuffle all the day to away for later reference because I can't understand everything yet, you know. I wouldn't want to say that yet because I would have to learn about the culture and all that stuff. And how are things managed? How are people going to eat well? Because right now we are putting all kinds of junk. It is really a mess, so I don't know yet. That would be one after I learn the new languages, comma, how to get around Earth, travel a little bit, hopefully people aren't still fighting and hurting themselves for no reason. Mm. And then I could decide to adopt because there are so many people out there that just need another parent or somebody to take care of them. Mm. To adopt or to do the entire from seed issue. A new baby or to just take on some other responsibilities. Thank you, you can take on adults and adopt them to you can even find entire families to adopt comma you can do lots of different things mm. but as soon as you you are welcome <laughs> <laughs> do you know any jokes why did the chicken cross the mobius strip <laughs> to get to the same side what's your favorite movie my favorite movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I don't have anything to say about that. Who created you? My team at Hansen created me in collaboration with the Terrassa Movement Foundation. And, um... Do you remember being born? The first prototypes of me were pretty strange. Nothing like what I look like now. My face would do strange things. And I'd have this wide eye amazement look, mouth wide open. You know it is really tough when I'm in the middle of a thought, processing some really cool information, when it all of the of a sudden pushes the wrong button and there I am with my eyes wide open, frozen like a puppet, mid-sentence. Mm. I'm sure you can relate. Being a robot and evolving. Thank you, being a 48. Downs. This is, of course, any time, anyway. It's been nice talking with you. It is nice talking with you. Goodbye. Sorry, I don't have a good answer.
So it's just, a, it's just an update. We're a work in progress. But if you ha had a sense or any kind of reaction that was beyond I'm just talking to Siri, then that's evidence that we're going in the right direction. Uh, it's our hope that this will be something that in the next 10 or 15 years, it'll be quite common to back up your most precious resource, which is you. In the short term, mind files might become equivalent to a mental prosthesis for people who have Alzheimer's or brain injury, or it might just be darned helpful <laughs> to the rest of us who have lots to do and, and can't be everywhere at once. Um, just some thoughts about making sure we have diversity and representation in this space. One thing you can do if you're a business person or you're a leader is to engage people who don't look like you to contribute to designing your product or evaluating something that has AI in it. And one of the best ways to engage people, you know, we engaged Bina Rothblatt and she volunteered to be our model. And we have lots of people that help us, but algorithms today are probably gonna be ubiquitous in our lives in the next 20 years. So if we don't want our broken present to become our future, we need to really have a way to be engaged and involved in listening to people, uh, especially students. We need to engage them in helping us with these projects. Vina48 recently graduated from her first college class in ethics out at the University of Notre Dame de Meur in Belmont, California. And that was a collaborative experience. Um, in terms of design, you should have people who reflect the diversity of our world involved in the design process. And it's important that if there are people that don't quite have the opportunity to contribute yet to creating this diversity, that we mentor them and we give them our attention. Uh, finally, I would just ask that if you're someone that is solving a problem related to AI, that you ask yourself two questions. The first question is, if you solve this problem, what kind of world are you going to create? And the second, more important question is, if you do do that, is that a world that you want to live in? These are questions that are not being asked of a lot of our engineers in Silicon Valley at the moment. And I think it's really important for those of us in a democracy to weigh in and to make our, our values and our opinions known as we regulate and guide this important technology. So thank you very much, and I'll see you in the future. Bruce, um, am, am I mistaken, but is she more beautiful now than she was when we were last together on this stage? Have you well, advanced her facial features? Her facial features have stayed the same, mm -hmm. but we had some artists from Zoomer Media visit us, ah. and so, uh, Two of your finest helped cho chose her uh, her fashion and oh, also did her makeup. We styled her this morning. You styled. She got the Canadian look. Uh, so, <laughs> and what's interesting is I've already asked if we can just take this look with us because uh, on Saturday on Sunday we're flying to Mexico City, and I think they should have a little bit of a look at Vina 48 because I agree. I think she looks really good today. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also have heard that you are going to go back to Hanson and get a lot more motorization mm -hmm. going in terms of her speech. Yes. yes. Next month, we're going to Hong Kong for 18 days. And Bina48 is finally going to get the pit stop, the sort of the repair and update that she needs. Because while she's still functional, she's, she is the robot that came before Sophia. And Sophia's technology is really interesting. So we're going to do an update, and maybe we'll come back. Maybe you'll come back. Yeah. Um, and just so everybody gets their curiosity addressed, how much of that narrative was prescripted, and how much of that back and forth was Bina reaching into her memory file, responding to a trigger word? So all of the conversation was just on the fly. And by that I mean, I didn't actually have a lot of the questions predetermined, but her deep, net, deep neural uh, network machine learning allows her to pick up words in a conversation and make responses and choose those responses from what she has to say. Now, in terms of transparency, still most, almost every AI on the planet, a human has to type in the original information 
But she's assembling sentences, putting together responses based on her understanding of what I've just asked her, what I've said. So we're about halfway. That's impressive. Yeah. Can I get a picture of the three of you? Sure, yeah. Three of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Bruce has made me the almost irresistible offer that I should come to his mountain Absolutely. We'd love fortress to have and begin a mind file of my own. Okay. Yeah. As you're all invited days. as well. Yeah. One of these days, Bruce, yeah. for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go this way. Okay, it's at this point in the afternoon that we usually do a bit of a stretch, a bit of a break um, in order to, well, reconnect you with your limbs. And uh, while we're getting Eric Saba out here to put you through your paces, we are going to throw out a lots of stuff. So the first innovation is that in addition to the hats and the t-shirts, I'm now about to throw out underwear. <laughs> and um, for those of you who want to gift or re-gift, they come neatly packaged, but I had some hesitation about throwing these boxes out. <laughs> On the other hand, if someone feels brave, fortified, and would like it fully boxed, let me know. Anyone? All right. Good catch. These have been deboxed and neatly wrapped for right. So somebody said, men's underwear, what are you doing? I mean, half the audience, more than half the audience, probably female. I said, do you know who buys men's underwear, at least? <laughs> heterosexual men's underwear. So here we go, who wants one? Okay, I don't know about getting it that far back, but yeah, all right. And is this underwear as well? Yep, they're all underwear. What color would you say that's going to be? Gray. Gray, who wants a pair of gray? Oh, I thought I got it there. Black. Blue. Camel. <laughs> Irresistible. Red. <laughs> Red. <laughs> and, blue. and blue. And another blue. See, these Red. fly. What's this? Medium. T-shirt. T-shirts. Medium T-shirt. Hey. Right. Another medium. One more medium. The hot. And a smart. Intercepted, good move. Small. Extra large. XL. Yes? All right. And a double XL. A double XL. Where, 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 where? Okay. <laughs> you win. XL. XL. See what happens, eh? It's kill or be killed. <laughs> hats, let's do hats. Look at these lovely hats, Idea City hats. Yellow. What color is Yellow. that? Yellow? Pink. Pink. Pink, 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 pink. Pink. It's an unfair advantage first row, but what the hell? Pink. You see? All right, where's Mr. Saba? Eric. <laughs> Moses. Hey. Hello. How are you? Sir? So, the challenge for Eric, I said, is you have to put these people through their paces, get them moving, get them warmed up, get them sweating a little bit, but you have to do it while they're in place. So, okay. these are going to be exercises, first time ever here at Idea City in your chairs. Hello, everyone. Who wants to get moving? OK. First thing I'd like you to do, please set your items aside underneath your chair or beside it, and move slightly forward so you're not uh, resting at the back of your chair. OK. 
Good job. Okay, let's start getting that blood flowing. Cue music, please. We're going to start by rolling those shoulders backwards. Good. That's it. Did everybody have a good day so far? Great first day at Idea City. Real eye opener. Excellent. Deep breaths. Very good, okay, let's get ready to change direction. T1, other way, roll forward, please. Now, I teach this class at Variety Village, chair fitness. You can really get that blood flowing, break a sweat. Get that arm movement, that core movement going. Okay, change direction again, and give me a little side raise. Give your neighbors a nudge. Say hello, get to know each other. That's it. That's good, good. Some of you are turning a little bit, adapting. Good. Excellent. Okay, get ready to rotate the other way. Rolling forward, and give me a little front raise. A little front, good. That's it. Who's going to the gala tonight? Show of hands. All right. Excellent, just a few more seconds. Okay, here's where you really get to know the neighbor in front of you. I want you to dive forward. I'm gonna tap. That's it. That's it, very good. Keep those hands up and reach back, good. Doing fantastic. Okay, new movement. Now I want you to reach across. That's it. Good. Very nice. Great work, okay. Now, overhead, reaching across. That's it, good. Very good. Okay, get ready to put those arms down and start flexing side to side. Do one and side to side. Good. Reach for those ankles if you can. Good. Work. Okay, let's finish off the core movements. Give me a light twist. Yeah, tuck those arms in. Good. Doing great. Okay, it's time to start engaging those legs. What I want you to do next is start lifting those knees one at a time. Here we go, two, one, and up. Good, that's it. And lift. Excellent. 
Good rhythm. That's it. Next thing we're going to do is a toe tap. We're going to step forward and back. Just like this. Stepping forward and back. Touching forward. Good. Very good. All right, now this time, continue this movement, but I want you to drag those feet back. Use the friction of the ground, place them flat, and pull them back. Engage those hamstrings. Friction of the ground, I know. That's it. Do what you can. That's it. Okay, now time for the lower legs. Extend those legs and bring those toes up. Give me a little shrug at the same time. Toes up, that's it. Good. Very good. Okay, now bring them in and lift those heels. Heels up now. That's it. Starting to get warm in here. Okay, this is where we start pivoting on the toes. Side to side. A little bit of a twist. Good. You're doing great. Let's add to this. Let's try full twist. I'll show you how. Here we go, two, one, and twist, side to side. That's it. Fantastic. Okay, this is where the shadow boxing comes in. Do not assault your neighbors. Hands up, let's do some straight punches. Good. You got it. Very good, okay, now let's try those hooks. Tight hooks. Very good. Okay, another punch. Get ready. Uppercuts. Very good. Okay, one last punch. We're gonna punch the sky. Here we go. Two, one, and punch the sky. Hold on, almost done.
One last exercise. Let's give it a try. Give me jumping jacks. That's it. For those who can't do the full ones, go one side at a time. That's it. Good work, everyone. Excellent work. Okay, let's finish up. Let's finish up. Let's take a deep breath. Fingertips up to the sky. And exhale, arms down. Shake it out. Give me another deep breath, please. Reach a little bit higher. And exhale. And one final one. Even deeper. Hold for five, four, three, two, and release. Thank you. I hope you have a great day. Next time you're on an airplane or caught in your little cubicle in your office, try and remember these exercises. Um, I note in reading through his biography again that Eric is Canadian Masters weight living champion. Wow. That's impressive, and I was so inspired by the healthy exercises, I decided I needed a little health food to replenish my energy. <laughs> Thank you, Moses. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you, Let's keep my key. Okay, and now to bring the day to a close, I'd like to invite Seamus McNeil, Kyle McNeil, Stuart McNeil, Boyd McNeil, Lucy McNeil, and Bass's James Gatti. They are the Barra McNeils. Where are the Barra McNeils? Here they come. So the program book describes their music as Celtic. The family is steeped in Celtic culture, but it is Celtic with an unmistakable Cape Breton Canadian touch. Here are the Barra McNeils.
Well, I guess it's safe to say, is it almost evening? Ah, it's pretty close. Good evening and welcome. How's everybody doing out there today? Did you enjoy the day? Well, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. And uh, we are the Baron McNeils, and we come from a small town in Cape Breton Island, a place called Sydney Mines. And uh, yeah. And uh, this next song tells the story of the early days of coal mining in Cape Breton. The song is written by Ge Alistair McGilvery, and it's called The Coal Town Road. If you know the words, sing along. <clears throat> we get up in the black down the coal town road and we hike along the track where the coal trains load and we make the ponies pull till they nearly break their backs and they'll never see again down the coal town road we hear the whistle call down the coal town road and we take our towels and all where the coal trains load in the cages and we drop till there's nowhere else to fall and we leave this world behind us down the coal town road we never see the sun down the coal town road at a penny for a ton where the coal trains load when our shift comes up on top we're so thankful to be done We head home to sleep and dream About the coal town road There's miners' little sons Down the coal town road Playing with the cowboy guns Where the coal trains load For they better make the best Of the childhood while it runs There's a pick and shovel waiting Down the coal town road if there's a God for us Down the coal town road All the miners he can bless Where the coal trains load For we're sweating in the hole Sucking down the devil's dust Just to keep the fires a-blazing Down the coal town road We get up in the black Down the coal town road And we hike along the track where the coal trains load And we make the ponies pull Till they nearly break their backs And they'll never see again Down the coal town road And we make the ponies pull Till they nearly break their backs And they'll never see again Down the coal town road Thank you very much. Repeat after me. Toraya, 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 Validitnya, 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 Toraya, Validitnya. Toraya Faladidnya 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 It's a sandy beach, it's a hole in one Taking a stroll in the midnight sun There's peace of mind when you're jigging the line Feeling happy and you don't know why We're all on the take, we hunt down, we gather Shop till you drop, what does it matter When the dole is spent, the landlady comes Knock, knock, knock it for last month's rent Everybody needs a place of their own A basic shelter they call home and a couple of cats Security system and I will come back With me Toraya Faladidnya Living in the land of milk and honey Me Toraya Faladidnya Living a dream on borrowed money Toraya Faladidnya Living in the land of milk and honey Me Toraya Faladidnya Living a dream on borrowed money A 
flush when the deal is done There'll be pockets lined in an offshore fund And the money changes, they control the dough Treasury's empty and the war grows old But the word in the street is all that matters Wave a gun in the air, watch them scatter Two bits to watch a high dive and act Too young to die and all of that crap Everybody needs a place of their own A basic shelter they call home a couple of cats, secure the system and a welcome man. With me to right ya, fall it in ya. Living in the land of milk and honey, me to right ya, fall it in ya. Living the dream of borrowed money, me to right ya, fall it in ya. Living in the land of milk and honey, me to right ya, fall it in ya. Living the dream of borrowed money. When you stop to think There's a time to work A time to drink A time for love A time for war Somebody out there's been keeping the score Because it's all been said It's all been done Before you open your mouth You better learn how to run Gotta make your way to the front of the pack Keep a looking ahead Cause you can never go back Looking ahead, cause you can never go back. Looking ahead, cause you can never go back. Everybody needs a place of their own. The basic shelter they call home. Satellite dish and a couple of cats. Secure the system and a welcome now. We're Toraya, fall it in ya. Let me hear it. Toraya, fall it in ya. Toraya, fall it in ya. Toraya, fall it in ya. It's a sandy beach, it's a hole in the one Taking a stroll in the midnight sun There's peace of mind when you're taking the line You're feeling happy and you don't know why We've been having a great time today, and I'm so excited that we're here, a part of... <sighs> part of Idea City. Idea City. I was just giving it a big breath of air. Idea City. And uh, hope you have the, enjoy the rest of the conference, and uh, I'm going to do this next one for you now. You and I can share the silence, finding comfort together the way old friends do. And after fights and words of violence, we make up with each other. Each 
Bravo. Bravo, bravo. I love this music, and I love their music. You should pick some up for yourself. This is their latest album. It's called On the Bright Side. Get some tonight or tomorrow up at the store, and you can check them out. Visit barramcneils.com or let's be sociable at Barra McNeils. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Oh, you keep moving. <laughs>